We'll begin with roll call. All members are present except Councillor Kovac, who I understand has just been delayed, uh, Councillor McFadden, who's away on a medical leave. All other members are present. Uh, our Indigenous land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the lands on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous people inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Unishinabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land, and by so doing, give our respect to its first inhabitants. Marvelous. Declarations of conflict of interest. Are there any? Seeing none. Approval of the minutes from the January 2nd, 2020 Regional Council meeting. I have a motion here moved by Santos and Thompson that the minutes of the January 9, 2020 Regional Council meeting be approved. Show of hands, all those in favor. Any opposed? That is carried. Approval of the agenda. I'll make note of a couple of amendments all. Uh, first, I think it would be very appropriate if we ask for our medical officer of health at some point to give us an update on the coronavirus. I think she's done that for us already uh, through correspondence, but I think the public should need to know that this situation is well in hand, certainly at Peel, uh, to prep for what may be coming. We also note that in the in-camera section, I've got two other documents we have to deal with. In-camera 22.3, we'll, we'll item it, eyes it as. Uh, Patrick Dagos from our solicitor and Patrick, uh, Mr. D'Agostino, on um, a land matter. And the second one, the housing master plan that we'll call 22.4. And the other item the clerk brings to my attention is we have correspondence 16.1 regarding the comprehensive review of 2041 the letter from Ganyel Walker Gomes, which I think will add to the presentation that we have as part of 7.2. Is there anything else anybody else wishes to add to the agenda? If not, I have a motion from Sato and Groves that the agenda for the January 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting include an oral update from the Medical Officer of Health regarding the coronavirus to be dealt with under staff presentations, item 8.2. And further, that the agenda for the Regional Council meeting of January 23rd include an additional communication regarding the 2041 Regional Urban Boundary and Municipal Comprehensive Review to be dealt with under items related to planning and growth management, item 16.1, and further that the agenda for the 23rd Regional Council meeting include an in-camera communication regarding advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege including communications necessary for the purpose to be dealt with under in-camera matters, item 22.3. And further, that the agenda for the January 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting include an in-camera status update on the housing master plan to be dealt with under in-camera matters, 22.4. And further, that the agenda for the January 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting be approved as amendment. Madam Clerk, show of hands or a recorded vote. No, just Show of hands. All those in favor of the amended agenda. That carries. Thank you very much. We will now go to our consent agenda. Uh, we move on to items 9 related to public works. First we have is 9.1. Do I have consent? Very good. On to communications 10.1. Consent? 10.2. Hold 10.2. Point two, thank you. Um, on to items related to health. Item 11.1. I have consent. 11.2. Consent. 11.3. Consent. The communication matters 20, uh, 12, 1, 2, and 3. I have consent. Items related to human services, we have none. Items related to planning, 15.1. I have consent. 17, items related to enterprise program, 17.1. Consent, 17.2. To be held, 17.3. To be held, 18, items under communications, 18.1. To be held, 18.2. On consent, <coughs> And that concludes the consent agenda. So, oh, actually, absolutely, 18.2 as well to be held. Sorry, that's not at all. So, there you have it. So, now I need a motion for approval of the consent agenda <coughs> as outlined. It has been moved by Councillors Vincente and Crombie, and I need a recorded vote for the consent agenda, please.
And that carries. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to delegations. Item 7.1, Sherry Lynn Landonchuk, President... Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, we had a handful that did not vote. I apologize. Um, okay, Madam Clerk, I would otherwise take it as unanimous. Was there anybody that would have voted against the consent agenda? Okay, but uh, just clerically, just so we know going forward that, that there's no glitches going forward. But uh, just for the record, the consent agenda was voted for unanimously. Thank you. Moving on. Delegations, item 7.1, Sherry Lynn Landonchuk, President and CEO, and Lori Platti, Public Relations Manager, Big Brothers and Sisters Appeal regarding Big Brothers, Big Sisters 2020, Tim Horton's Bowl for Kids' Sake. Ladies, welcome. Good morning, Chair Anika and Regional Council's members. It's um, wonderful to be here this morning on behalf of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Peel, and I'm with my colleague Lori Platty, um, here to share some information and um, invite a bit of a challenge for our Tim Hortons Bowl for Kids' Sake. So thank you for having us here this morning. Um, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Peel has been proudly running our Tim Hortons Bowl for Kids' Sake event for 52 years now throughout the region of Peel. This is our largest fundraiser of the year with the goal of raising over $150,000 to support our mentoring programs for young people to ignite their power and their potential. When you think about mentoring itself and the importance in our community, it is an upstream intervention that helps us prevent lots of issues down the road. Mentoring is simple in concept, and many of you have probably had um, natural mentors that come into your world and that have made a difference in your life. Big Brothers Big Sisters of Peel helps bring mentors into the lives of children and youth who don't have that opportunity and need that intervention to have that person, that one person, that's going to help them move forward with the potential that they actually have. Our Big Brothers Big Sisters um, event, our Tim Hortons Bowl for Kids event, is a really important part of raising the funds to ensure that we bring early intervention prevention strategies into our community. We will be having five events from February 23rd to May 25th in Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon. It's a great way for the community to get involved and have fun while raising valued dollars to provide mentors for our young people. Many of you here, and I see many of you, have been involved in our Bowl for Kids Sake event over the years, so it's wonderful. I'm, I'm speaking to many of you who know exactly what I'm talking about. I won't talk about bowling ability here, but I will talk about support, which is the most important part of our event. Bowlers are asked to raise $150,000. Um, dollars each or $900 as a team. Our theme this year is go for gold. So we ask participants to wear their best gold medal attire and we have lots of great contests for best dressed and best team spirit to make it a great fun day for everyone who participates. Our event kicks off on February 3rd on February 23rd sorry with the incredible support of the Peel Regional Police. They fill up 60 lanes at Classic Bowl, and we're proud to announce that Chief Durarapa the, is the honorary chairperson of our Tim Hortons Bowl for Kids' Sake this year. One of a few different fun challenges we've had with our event is the City Challenge, where we have a big trophy who goes to the city within the region who raises the most money. We are so thankful to have had the tremendous support from Councillor Fortini and everyone at the City of Brampton, as well as from Mayor Thompson and the Town of Caledon. We are here today to issue a challenge for further support. We are asking for the support of our Mississauga Bowling event and for representatives from the Region of Peel and the City of Mississauga to put in a team for our event on Saturday, February 29th from 2 to 4 at Classic Bowl for our Mississauga Community Day event. Last year, Councillor Fortini raised over $25,000 at our Brampton event and Mayor Thompson raised over $18,000 at our Caledon event. We hope to expand this great work to the City of Mississauga. Our events 
are a great time out and more than anything, a great reason to help our youth in our community who are facing adversity have the mentor they need to succeed to be powerful residents in the region of Peel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, before I go to my list, which is Councillor Medeiros, big shout out to Councillor Fortini. That's a heck of a job to raise $25,000 for such a cause. Very, very well done. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and certainly, uh, um, you know, it's good that we recognize uh, my good friend, Councillor Fortini, for uh, he's been passionate about it. I see what him and his assistant go through every year. And, uh, but more so, you know, um, is the way that he's really educated to us to the importance of the organization. Um, you know, at the City of Brampton, uh, former uh, Councillor Gibson, uh, he was a big champion. And, uh, and uh, as one of the new councillors back in 2014, uh, this was one of the first sort of events that we were uh, engaged with. And we've seen it grow. And, and now with my colleague, Councillor Fortini, taking it over. Um, but more so, can you speak to us where the money goes and how the money is used? Uh, because I know it, it's, it's vital, it's crucial. It's one of your mm -hmm. larger events. And and uh, uh, it's just, um, you know, besides being a, a great community event and seeing everyone engaged, but it's so important, these funds. So if you can just talk a little bit more where, where the funds go to. That's great, thanks. The, yes, it is a fundraising event, and that's, I mean, all of the other things put in place, they, it does raise the valuable funds to support our 13 core mentoring programs that we have at Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Peel. Many of you probably know about the Big Brother, Big Sister program, which is our longest standing one-to-one -one program that, that goes on in, in the community, where we match a adult mentor with a, a young child. However, we also have um, different hybrid models of that one-to-one -one program, as well as um, many school-based mentoring programs. So we're very active throughout the whole region in both of the school boards with kids in school, both in a group mentoring model and also in the one-to-one -one model. Also, we're working um, strongly with our uh, newcomer population in terms of bringing mentoring programs that meet the needs of certain um, newcomer groups and also different um, cultural groups that, that need different nuanced pieces of mentoring put into play to support their communities. So your dollars raised go directly to supporting those mentoring relationships. We have a professional social work team on staff who works at monitoring the the, um, mentoring relationships to ensure they are safe for all children and volunteers in our community. So that's the really important work that we do in terms of maintaining um, the relationship. We want it to grow and thrive and be strong and have the best possible outcomes for the children and youth that our mentoring is touching. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Martin, thank you. Mayor Crombie. Just on behalf of the city of Mississauga as well, we really want to thank you for the work you do. I know, yes, I learned just a number of folks who um, have been mentors yes. in the past and have had significant impact on the lives of their of their mentorees. So yeah. um, we'll we'll find a way to get engaged with, for you. But I'll I'll tell you right up front right now that the 29th is our big hospital fundraiser right. too, and I know many of us will yes. be in attendance yeah. there. So I apologize in advance, but we'll find another way to ensure that you get supported. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fortini. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, really. It's mostly my assistant. She's already sent out with a bunch of letters yesterday uh, to raise money. But, uh, you know, Grant Gibson did an amazing job in the past. And when I took over, it's been like four or five years now. Uh, we've been trying to raise money. But last year, what really hit me is uh, they didn't know, like, most of the money goes for for kids, you know, at, uh, for tuitions, for universities and college. And since my daughter was uh, volunteering in Malton and she told me a lot of great things, so mm -hmm. we're gonna continue supporting. I gotta thank all the councillors also for donating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Thompson. I guess the question I wanted to ask you is about Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Great. Um, you fill a demand, but how are you for volunteers? Do you have enough people to serve the needs that you have out there? 
Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you're not shocked by that. We have, uh, we have over 1,300 volunteers who help us do the work of the agency. Last year, we supported just under 2,000 kids throughout the region of Peel. So just in terms of the scope of our mentoring programs and what that looks like. One of our ongoing, I, I always say our resources are, we need dual resources. One is we need the financial resources. And the other thing is we need the volunteer resources. And really, frankly, they're equally important to keep us moving forward. The um, supply um, certainly does not meet, meet the demand. We have um, waiting lists you know, in, in all of our programs that are both um, stated waiting list and implied waiting list. Because one of the things we try to do is not to focus on the waiting list. Being on a waiting list is hard for a child. And we're really sensitive to that and wrapping around the fact that, like, what if it doesn't work for them? What does that, what is that doing? So we don't want to kind of double down on any kind of damage or, you know, implication that that may have. So we're really trying to focus on the opportunities when they're there and when we have volunteers volunteers in a certain area then move into what we already know because of our strong partnerships and stakeholders that we have who support our work and can identify very quickly you know where where there's children we have an intake process at the organization um, that so we do have some children who we um, support in more of a recreational program until they are, can be matched in the program of their choice volunteers um, we work hard at recruiting volunteers that's something else of course um, you can support us with and help us with in terms of um, in your constituencies um, s giving a shout out to us as an opportunity. It's, there's all kinds of opportunities to volunteer with kids. It's not, um, you know, it, it's not a heavy burden. We have flexible programming. As long as the families and the volunteer are in favor, we can usually make um, something work. So it's a great way to work with children to get experience and to um, up the civic engagement pieces. We have lots of partnerships with our, our colleges and of course UTM as well to look at um, bringing students into, into our mentoring um, purview as well. So um, targeted recruitment is something we have to do. If we have a specific geographical pocket within the region that we have a lot of kids identified, we will try to do some real targeted recruitment because geographics matter if, for a volunteer. They want to be able to go somewhere close um, to where they are um, so it just all a bunch of factors make make a match successful and that's one of them if it's you know you get you can get there quickly and in a way especially around the region sometimes it's tricky we wouldn't match a volunteer from Mississauga up in Caledon it just it, it just the time commitment just enhances then so volunteers are always needed so thank you Mayor Thompson for bringing that up it, it's really a, a key resource that we need to be able to thrive and I know it's uh, greatly appreciated because I know even when I used to co coach house league hockey yes. different yes. times, the big brother would bring an individual, yeah. you know, pick them up, bring them to hockey so that he has an opportunity to be part of a sport and, you know, yep. finance their way to that. And I have to say those, those are important things to allow them to be part of a, of a community which they wouldn't be able to have the opportunity to do, yep. especially for a single parent. So I, I see a lot of the good work that you do do in Caledon, and those examples is I'm just using as one that I've seen. And it isn't just one-offs, it, no. it's, it, it's more prevalent than a lot of people fail to realize. For sure. And it, but it's really good to see. But anyway, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sh Sherry, Laurie, thank you very much. I guess the message we got, if you can help the cause now, that's great, but I'm so glad for your question, Mayor Thompson, that whatever time you have, give us a shout. We might be able to make it work. And of course, money's always great, one size fits all. That's right, Okay, yes. I'm glad you got that message out. Thank you very much for being here. I have a receipt moved by Mayor Thompson and Councillor Medeiros. All those in favor, that is carried. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank ladies. you, thank you okay. so much. That thank you to everyone who's to been supporting our event. <laughs> thank you. That brings us to 7.2, delegations. Michael Melling, partner, Davies Howe, LLP, on behalf of the Wildfield Village Landowners Group regarding 2041 Regional Urban Boundary and Municipal Comprehensive Review. And we've also added the correspondence 16.1 at this time as well. Michael, welcome. Shabbat and called speak. Thank you. Uh, members of Council, uh, in 1997, 
I left a position as a member of the former Ontario Municipal Board and I started work at the law firm I work at today and I was hired for one case and one case only. It was a proposed urban boundary expansion in the town of Caledon and specifically uh, Bolton. And that was, of course, the last major residential expansion that there was in Bolton just over 20 years ago. And I don't tell you this to take you down memory lane. I tell you because it's important to my presentation today because at that time, the Caledon official plan was based on what was called the trinodal theory of growth, that growth would be directed to Bolton, to Mayfield West, and to Caledon East. And because of the Oak Ridge's moraine and the Green Belt, of course, uh, Caledon East came out of that equation and Caledon began to proceed on what has become a binodal growth strategy involving Bolton and Mayfield West. I'm here today to present a new vision for the future of Caledon to 2041, a vision in which Bolton and Mayfield West grow together instead of growing apart. And in preparing what you're about to see today, uh, our team started with a basic principle of planning in Ontario, which is we plan on the basis of the location and characteristics of land, not who owns it. We looked at the existing and planned infrastructure. We looked at opportunities to development and constraints to development. So what you're about to see is a proposal that is based on planning principles, not on land ownership. And finally, uh, we took our inspiration from the tremendous success that the cities of Brampton and Mississauga have achieved uh, based on planning, based on logical expansion and not on land ownership. So uh, here it is. I'd like to point out four things about this proposal. Uh, the first is with respect to the boundaries. And I'm hoping that councillors will see that at the south end, we've got Mayfield Road. On the east, we've got the proposed urban boundary expansion approved by Regional Council for ROPA 30. And at the west over here, uh, we jog over to the proposed and planned extension of Highway 410. Uh, up at the top here, we have a boundary that I'm going to describe as a little softer uh, because ultimately the precise location of that boundary is going to be determined by you as you complete your growth management exercise and you determine how much growth is going to be directed to Caledon. And so unlike the other, two, other three boundaries which are I would describe as harder uh, boundaries, uh, that one may be subject to change depending upon what the province instructs all of us about how one calculates the amount of land that's required for urban expansion. They haven't done that yet, but they've told us that they're going to do that soon. The second thing I wanted to point out is the concentration of proposed employment uses, knitting together the existing employment and planned employment uses, which were in Tullamore and Mayfield West. And the third thing I wanted to point out was the concentration of residential in the vicinity of Bolton, which, as I've already advised, hasn't had a significant residential expansion since 1998. And the fourth and final thing I wanted to point out about this slide is the terminus of the seven existing sewer lines, which are in uh, Brampton, in one, two cases rather, reach uh, Mayfield Road. The key advantages of this uh, proposal are as follows. Uh, I respectfully suggest to you it presents a logical northerly progression of growth to 2041. It gradually knits together B Bolton and Mayfield West, dispenses with the two solitudes and brings them together as a community. It represents a cost-efficient extension of existing and planned infrastructure in accordance with plans you already have. 
and it consolidated, consolidates an employment area which builds upon the existing two areas in Mayfield West and Tullamore. And finally, it optimizes the planned extension of the GTA West uh, corridor uh, up to 410 and, of course, the corridor itself, which has regional council support. So from a growth management point of view, wanted to say a, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, wh what we did was we calculated, uh, using our client's growth management consultant, the amount of land that is likely to be allocated to growth in Caledon, not Mississauga or Brampton, uh, based on what we know. And I'm going to acknowledge to you right now, we do not know what the new provincial calculation methodology will say or do, which is why I talked about that northern boundary perhaps having to be adjusted. Once we find out how we're supposed to calculate land and how different that is from the old methodology, we'll know a bit more But what we tried to do was calculate the Caledon. Michael, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt for one moment. I, I trust everybody wants to continue on, but we've reached the five minutes. If I could have a motion just to carry on, so we're following Councillor Parrish, Councillor Raz, to extend the time. All those in favour, that is carried. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Council. I, I won't uh, dwell on the amounts of the expansion. I've told you how they are calculated, and the intention is to support the 2019 growth plan population and employment targets to 2041. In terms of water infrastructure, we've identified the existing regional transmission of water mains. We've identified as well the existing pressure zone six water mains and the existing reservoir pump station and elevated tank. And of course, the regional uh, lines are on Kennedy, Mayfield, and Coleraine. For wastewater, there are seven sanitary sewers existing south of the proposed area and a pump station as well, and all of that is consistent with your approved water and wastewater master plan process, which has reached the public information uh, session number two level in November of 2019. For transportation, this is a map of the area showing all of the major roads, including pr planned infrastructure. What we're trying to do is maximize the use of the proposed GTA West corridor, the 410 extension, and the existing and planned arterial roads. So from a planning benefits point of view, the proposed employment area will create a large contiguous area connecting Tullamore and Mayfield West that will be attractive to large employers. It will capitalize on the proposed highway infrastructure. The residential area will be a logical extension of Bolton, building on your approved uh, ROPA 30 now before the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, and it'll be a logical extension of existing residential communities in Brampton, and it will proceed in a logical south-to-north fashion, supporting the efficient use of the existing services and reducing trip lengths to and from uh, southern destinations. So uh, why am I here? I'm here uh, to ask you, to direct staff and external consultants who are, as we speak, uh, working on your proposed settlement boundary expansion as part of the 2041 MCR process that is underway. And why am I here? Why am I at Regional Council? Uh, because under the 2019 growth plan, uh, you have a new and unique responsibility. Uh, the province has decided that municipal comprehensive reviews have to be done at the regional level, at the upper tier level, and urban boundary expansions must take place at the regional or upper tier level. The approval authority is the minister, and there are no appeals. I have come to you as the body that has the authority and the jurisdiction to make this decision. I'm not asking you, because it would be ridiculous, to make that decision, to favor one option over another. I'm asking you to ask your advisors, your staff, and your outside consultants to study this option as part of the process that is already underway. And subject to any questions that you may have, that is all I had intended to say. Mr. Melling, thank you. If you'll stand in place, there are questions. But first, I think I'll go to our Planning Commissioner, Adrian Smith, uh, to give a response, and then we'll go to our list. Adrian? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did think it was uh, appropriate to just confirm uh, for the delegation a couple of things. Uh, first, that um, already through our ongoing Peel official plan, the 2041 uh, OP review and the Municipal Comprehensive Review, um, we have identified a need for, for settlement expansion for both residential and population lands to meet our, our 2041 growth. And uh, we're continuing to update that work and uh, as, uh, as Mr. Melling has identified, we're waiting for the province to provide their land needs assessment methodology, the final methodology, but the work that's underway continues to show that we will need settlement boundary expansion uh, to accommodate that growth. And we have initiated our work program to undertake that settlement expansion uh, boundary work. We've retained consultants and we've got technical, technical background underway. Um, stakeholders who are interested in that process can expect to see more information about that process and the results of the, of the work as it unfolds, both on our website and at the next um, uh, Open Houses Public Information Centres, which we're scheduling for, for March, so people can begin to see some of the, some of the technical work, work underway. Um, already through our, our OP review and Municipal Comprehensive Review uh, underway for the last few years, we have begun to receive um, numerous requests for consideration around settlement boundary expansion, and that includes requests from individual landowners and from various landowners groups that have, uh, have interests uh, in, in potential settlement expansion. And we've certainly advised all those groups that we're, we'll take, take that information into consideration. Uh, we'll be evaluating that and responding to all, to all those requests as we undertake our technical work. And, uh, and the request that we've seen here today is sort of fits in, uh, in line with those kinds of, uh, kinds of requests. And we're, we will be taking all the information that we get and requests and considering that and responding and, and considering it appropriately. And, and quite frankly, we, we uh, won't be surprised if we receive more of those requests in the, in the coming months and years as well. So I just wanted to make that clear. Adrian, thank you. To my list, Mayor Thompson. Yes, uh, Michael, thank you for your delegation. And uh, I, I know uh, your, your uh, person that uh, you represent has had quite an interest in calendar for a long time. And uh, I appreciate what you bring forward, but we're going through a complete overhaul of our official plan because we have to take a lot of the greenfield development now. But here's another dilemma. 80% of Caledon is protected, 20% is future development, and out of that, we got to basically aim for a 60-40 tax ratio base between residential and non-residential. Because if we don't, the green belt areas will not be sustainable in the long-term future. In the uh, provincial policy statement, um, dictates that we can lay out areas where employment lands need to be, even though we don't have numbers for it, but it can be designated as such. I see the province has jumped in now, but we have an exercise to go through. So I encourage you, if you want to be taken very seriously, I encourage you to work with Sylvia Kirkwood. We have a lot of consultation. We're going to the public. We're going to be in consultation all year. We've got a very aggressive work plan on our official plan. And I encourage you to be part of that process. So going forward, we have a lot of work to do. It's great. I understand the biases and everything you bring forward. It sounds good. But we got to look at a holistic on what works for Callan and how it balances. There might be some good ideas that we can definitely implement. I thank you for that. But I encourage you to uh, come to Caledon and have that open dialogue with our guys because uh, we have a huge engagement with the public. We want everybody to be part of this process going forward because it isn't just about the next 20 years, it's beyond that. And we gotta get it right. And it's not fair for us that uh, we don't take responsibility to figure out how to balance our tax base because we're part of the region appeal. And it's, Brampton's working hard to get there. Mississauga's done a great job to build their employment tax base. But we gotta do, we have responsibility to deliver on ours as well. So. I understand with the numbers, but we got to look big picture to define where the small picture looks like. So thank you very much for your delegation and I encourage you to get engaged in Caledon. Your Worship, thank, thank you for those comments. And I absolutely will contact Ms. Kirkwood. I, I do aspire, although I have always failed to be taken seriously, so I'm, I'm going <laughs> to do my best. Um, 
and, and if this is an invitation to come to uh, Caledon, um, I will herd my cats. I, I currently have within the Wildfield Village Landowners Group uh, seven major landowners, and they're busy going out soliciting other membership in the group. Uh, I will talk to them, but I will be strongly recommending that I make an appearance before Caledon Council, and I very much appreciate the invitation to do so. Very good. Councillor Fortini. Thank you, and I agree with uh, Mayor Thompson. So I'm going to ask to uh, move the staff report and continue uh, uh, the MCA re request for the MCA report. Thank you. Okay, I'm, uh, Councilor Bertie, I'm going to ask you to write that out so that I've got it properly before us, and if you can get a seconder, and that way we know. Do you want to uh, let it get it formally before me and second it accordingly, then I'll know what's before all of my colleagues? Um, that's why I'm asking to write out so we're just exactly clear on what you have before the chair at the appropriate time. No, I think he's moving a formal motion. Is that right? You're not moving receipt of the delegation alone. You're moving a formal motion at this time. And so if, if I could just have it properly seconded and before the chair and passed around so that we're all clear. And we will come back to you then. <laughs> Councillor Innes. Thank you. So I'll, I'll wait to speak to the formal motion because I think that it's um, it's completely unnecessary in the sense that we just heard from staff that um, Mr. Melling's presentation, like all other submissions that have been received by the Region of Peel, will be reviewed. Um, but I'll leave that for a, a discussion. So thank you, Mr. Melling, for your presentation. Um, as you're aware, I represent uh, the uh, wards three and four, which is the east side. Um, and so the entire portion along the bottom from Airport Road, basically east, is in my ward. Um, before us is a letter from Mr. Walker, who represents the Mayfield East Landowners Group. And in it is a specific question um, and in regards, and you, you sort of hinted at it in your last response to, um, to Mayor Thompson, uh, in regards to they've asked um, who exactly on public record are you specifically representing in this area um, because they own land in this area and they want to ensure that there is not confusion um, between the desires of their option that they're preferring and putting forward uh, and yours. So I think that we need to be very clear because there are multiple landowners and I can tell you that when your presentation came forward, I had quite a few residents contact me um, saying that they were not part of this landowners group, nor were they even aware of it. Um, and they had concerns because it wasn't the vision that they were hoping and that they're putting forward through the official plan process. So I think that we need to be very clear about how much of this land you actually own or have um, have in your landowners group. Uh, thank you, uh, councillors. So I'm at a bit of a disadvantage in that uh, Gagnon Law didn't send me a copy of the letter, um, nor did they contact me, which they could have done, and they certainly know who I am and I know who they are. And they could have simply asked me that question and I could have provided whatever answer I could. Um, my situation right now is that I'm bound by the Law Society's rules of professional conduct which say that I'm not permitted to give any information about my clients out without their consent. And as I sit here, I don't have consent. Um, what I can tell you is that my clients own uh, a few hundred acres of land. Um, there are obviously thousands of acres of uh, land. There are approximately 50 to 60 major land holdings mm -hmm. within the area where my clients have been reaching out to those folks to ask them if they are interested in joining the group. But I'd like to, I guess, make a more fundamental point, which is that uh, this letter uh, raises, uh, again, the problem we've been experiencing continuously between viewing Caledon as some kind of battle between Mayfield West and Bolton. And, uh, you know, I would love to have a dialogue with uh, the Gagnon Law <coughs> Firm and their clients. All they need to do is phone me so we can have that discussion. That's all I can tell you at this so point. So I think, thank you, Mr. Melling. And I, and I guess my question it might not be for Mr. Melling, it might be for Adrian. Um, when we receive proposals from not just specific landowners, but actual landowner groups, how are we ensuring that uh, when it's a landowner's group that comprises a significant portion of land, that the people that actually own that land 
is part of that landowner's group and that is actually their desires. Because right now, some of the residents in this group feel that it's being misrepresented that this is actually their wishes to be brought forward when it's not. So how do we ensure that that doesn't happen moving forward? Um, through, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to, to, be, to be frank, um, when we're doing our, our planning evaluation and consideration of the issues that are raised by landowners group, we're, we're, not, um, we're not focused on the, on the ownership and, and sort of who owns what. We're focused on the issues that are raised, the vision for the community, the, the, uh, the considerations that the region and, and council are obliged to have through provincial policy and through our, through our own interests. That's really what our focus is, not on who owns what. And so the predominant, I guess the, the, the main concern that I want to ensure that we're covering is that when we are going through this process, it's not specifically who owns what, I just want to ensure that they're all notified. So for example, some of these residents did not know that this was on the present, that this was even on the agenda. Some of them knew, then they all start talking. I want to make sure that all the landowners, especially in the white belt uh, area, are specifically notified as we're moving forward in this process. I know that the town of Caledon is doing our responsibility in reaching out to them and reaching out to the various organizations like the Peel Federation of Agriculture um, because there is concern about connectivity and, and ensuring a viable agricultural community. Um, I just want to ensure that from a regional perspective that we are reaching out to all of the landowners to ensure that they are part of the process and aware of what all of the options are before them. So through me, through you, Mr. Chair, absolutely. Um, we uh, we're embarking, I guess, uh, beginning in March, in our first sort of next round of public consultation. We'll absolutely uh, ensure that there is wide uh, um, notice of those those open houses, and particularly any uh, any affected landowners or what have you are are notified for sure. Okay, and I'd also ask that when we're doing that notification, that we ensure that we contact groups such as the PFA to make sure that they are, are informed as well. Um, and we may even want to consider having a special one with the agricultural community because of, of the amount of viable agriculture we still have left in that, that area. Um, and so with that, I will say uh, thank you, Mr. Melling. I know that uh, it's, a, it's an exciting process and you had mentioned the fact that we are moving from a trinodal growth strategy um, towards uh, a different plan. We don't know what that plan is going to be. Uh, and it's uh, preemptive for any of us to suggest that we have an idea of what that plan is going to look like um, because we really do need that feedback from the community. I think that that was part of the reason that I had brought forward the white belt visioning exercise uh, from the beginning. Uh, and as a follow-up to Mayor Thompson, to ensure that we have adequate employment lands to be financially sustainable and viable into the future and to continue to care for that 80% of protected land uh, in our municipality. So um, thank you for bringing it forward and um, uh, I, I will speak to a motion when it comes forward. I, I, I will say I don't, your ask is, is, a, is a great ask. By you coming here today, I suspect that the 30 or so uh, landowners requests that we've already had, they're now going to delegate this council. So we've opened up the gates. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure that they will now come to Caledon and, and delegate, um, and uh, which, which is going to take some time, but it's very important. So it's time well spent. So thank you for coming today. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Uh, yes, um, uh, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that Mississauga has a pre-region meeting every once in a while when there's issues on here that have, are of interest to us because we're defending our rear ends as much as we can. Um, our staff was concerned, Mr. Melling, that what you're asking for might uh, take some population away from where we need it in Mississauga, but we talked it through yesterday and they, they would prefer this to go, as your ask has suggested, straight to the MCR committee, which we have representation on. All the lower tiers have p staff people on there. And I'm very happy to hear from Adrian that um, public meetings will start in March. I think that's how everybody will be informed as to exactly what progress we're making. And I think the point you made uh, about owners versus good planning is a very significant point. Uh, we have to get the people out of it and do what's best for the whole region of Peel since we're all now part of it forever. And uh, so I would suggest I will support the referral and, and if we do get more developers coming in and asking or representatives, I have no problem with that. We all know who's here and what they're up to and it's part of the fun of this job. So I will support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Milling. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. Just some quick questions for you. You outlined the area that's uh, gonna have, uh, I believe 1,200 hectares of uh, residential and 900 hectares of um, um, 
employment. Um, can you break down how many jobs that'll be? So we haven't done the analysis to that level, and it's particularly difficult to do so in the absence of an approved provincial methodology for doing so. <coughs> there have been way too many uh, long hearings at the former Ontario Municipal Board about how you make those calculations. And once we get the numbers from the province, I'm hopeful that what it means is that everyone, public sector, private sector, we're all going to be working from the same numbers and the same assumptions. So I apologize, Councillor. I don't have that at this point in time, but that's why. Right. Um, sorry, Adrian, can you maybe comment on that? I think it's, uh, it's really the same answer. We, as part of the, um, the Municipal Comprehensive Review and the Land Needs Assessment methodology, we, we will be obliged uh, to identify very specifically the number of jobs and, and uh, you know, the types of jobs that will, that will need to be accommodated through settlement boundary expansion. That number is, is uh, floating around a little bit while we're, we're waiting for the Land Needs Assessment, the final methodology from the province. So, so we, we will have that, but I don't have that for you today. Right. A um, couple more questions. Um, from what I recall, a couple years back, this area was under review um, by the province for, I believe, some type of logistics hub or uh, related to logistics. Is that still ongoing or did, will that affect it? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not aware of anything specific by the province. Um, the region has done some some good has does ongoing goods movement work where we look at what the goods movement needs are for the are for the region and any of that sort of background technical work would all be input to our municipal comprehensive review. Something to consider and we'll be looking at a whole variety of of uh, em employment um, uh, broad employment needs for the region, and right. that would include goods movement and other things. Right. And so just the last question, just because this is this uh, uh, is right just north of the wards that I represent. Um, I guess you're mentioning it's, um, so you have the proposed area. Um, is there some type of, because you said there's a transition from employment from uh, wards nine and 10, which is the area that I represent into, into Caledon. Um, just broadly or roughly, what do you see? Do you see the residential more north or closer to the, the boundary line? Like, uh, how do you envision it? So, Councillor, if I can just go back, and I apologize this takes so long. The basic concept is blue on the left and yellow on the right. Oh, yes. But I need to be very clear about that. Uh, the, the town of Caledon is going through a process in which it will be determining what its objectives and goals are for specific land uses within specific areas. Right now, what's on the table is a proposed urban boundary expansion for the regional municipality of Peel. This is a vision that my client's consultants uh, support, but there's a lot of process at this region and ultimately at Caledon and with the input of Brampton and Mississauga that has to happen down the road. So I, I would caution anyone that I, I'm not saying that as a result of your process, the one you're going through right now here in Peel, you're going to be determining at a granular level where the employment and the residential goes. And the only other thing I would say is this. Provincial policy, the official plan in Peel, the official plan in Brampton, all provide policies which require that we ensure the compatibility of adjacent residential and employment uses. And all employment uses and residential uses are required by policies you already have to work in, in harmony with one another. And whatever results from this process to 2041, I am confident that that's what's going to happen. So the, the northeast corner of Brampton is, is, is going to be um, there's plans for uh, employment right now, and I'm just wondering um, what the logical transition is that you guys are envisioning. We see a whole bunch of uh, uh, employment to the west. I, 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 I realize you say it's not set in stone, um, but uh, the majority of it is residential uh, to the east, so I'm just... Um, 
curious as to, to why this uh, setup was chosen. Any, any reason in particular? Because I've been hearing that, you know, there's, a, there's like a seamless transition from employment and uh, residential. But uh, uh, for my particular wards, uh, I, I just see the residential. It doesn't mesh with the, the, the employment part of it. So the province tells us we got to try to get our workplaces closer to where we live in order to reduce commuting times. The Peel official plan says that, Brant official plan says that. So if I could just direct your attention, Council, this area over here is planned and existing as a major employment area. This area over here is a major employment area, which is centered around and dependent upon the ultimate 410 extension and up to the GTA West quarter. This area here, Tullamore, is an existing and planned employment area. So what we have proposed is that ultimately to 2041, 21 years from now, there'll be a large area of contiguous employment lands which will allow for large employment users to establish there and take advantage of this highway and that highway over here. This area over here is already building out or built out and coming to conclusion as a major employment area. Much of it was held up, as you know, by the delay with the 427 extension. Right. But now that that's resolved, right. we, we know that these lands are gonna come on for employment uses. Right, and um, I, I think if you look at the history of uh, particularly the east end of Brampton, a lot of it was emplo uh, employment uh, originally, which was uh, converted to residential along Highway 50. And so uh, it is a concern for me that uh, you'll see even more residential uh, connecting to the existing residential we have. In Ward 9 and 10, we have the least uh, amount of employment in all of Brampton. And so, um, you know, I, I could support uh, the, the, um, the, the report uh, to have, um, you know, this uh, analyzed a little bit more, but... Uh, um, I don't think it, uh, uh, for it to be uh, entirely residential on the east, eastern part of this plan uh, would make a, a, a whole lot of sense. Uh, so that's just my uh, opinion. And uh, I think when, uh, you know, when the analysis is done and the discussions are had that uh, hopefully there'll be a little bit more mix. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mellings, for your presentation. Um, I think you said it best, and, and Councillor Parrish reiterated it. Let's look at the where the lands, where it makes most sense for development, not who owns the lands. That's always been the problem in Caledon. Um, and so this is actually a very good presentation. Um, I think all you're asking for is, is for it to come back with some more information and the analysis be done on it. So I don't think you're asking for us to make a decision today on whether or not this is going to move forward. I mean, this is sort of the same as anything that comes before us where, where we're asking for more information. So I think it's a very simple ask. Um, I know that uh, I didn't realize that you were the board member in the uh, 1997 board hearing. Uh, I, was, I had actually just left the board and I became counsel to one of the landowner oh, okay. groups. Okay, so I, I, I lost, by the way. <laughs> so you know this well, and Bolton has not had any growth. You're absolutely right in over 20 years. So I, I really have no um, problems in sending this back to staff to include it in the MCR. It was mentioned by staff that they are in the process of doing it. And, you know, if other landowners come forward, then, you know, they can join the group and, and, and uh, have their um, request looked at through the MCR process. And I think that the province did say that the region, the upper tier, is the one who conducts the MCR. So I think it'll be a very interesting, um, well, I think we'll have more information once the MCR process is, has been concluded and I look forward to that discussion then. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, uh, through the chair. Uh, thank you for the delegation. Um, regarding the, the one thing that interests me always, uh, and and I guess when we discuss um, uh, the growth plan and uh, looking at the MCR review, is you've basically aligned it with our a lot of. Uh, Sort of, you've aligned it with our uh, our water plan, our wastewater, our transportation master plan. 
So that alignment, you know, from a common, someone who maybe doesn't understand all the technical aspects makes sense. And, um, and also from, a, a, I guess, a financial perspective, uh, because there's the, the whole, uh, I guess, planning aspect, but also what makes financial sense. And, you know, someone who's sitting here from Brampton and looking at um, the needs in terms of investing in infrastructure, is this normally the, the, the planning, is, it, is this sort of the um, natural sort of line of thought when you're looking at building communities? Because what I see here is you're, you're completing a community and allowing, like, it, it's very interesting. Um, to me, it, it, it makes sense. So is this something that is applicable to other communities? Like, is this something specific to this area, or is this usually what makes planning sense that you go along where the infrastructure is built? Uh, it makes financial sense, and that's really sort of the, from a basic level, that's how you build communities. So understanding that different communities have different wants, and and Brampton, we're going through our official plan review as well. But it just sitting at this table and looking at you know, it aligns with our existing infrastructure. It aligns with, you know, our transportation master plan. And it makes financial sense. So what am I missing? What am I, um, is this something that, uh, I'm just saying is that this sounds like the standard that you would use when you're, when you're planning across communities. And this seems to be the norm, what you suggested. Am I missing something? Councillor. I always try to learn from public processes, and I almost always do. And your 2041 MCR is in its infancy, as I think uh, Mr. Smith has acknowledged. And there's a lot of public input that you're going to get. And you're going to be hearing uh, from citizens and from developers who are going to offer you different ideas about what the most effective way is to use the public infrastructure that exists and that which is planned. But I'm hoping that none of them are going to disagree on this principle, which is we plan in a logical, orderly fashion, taking advantage of and maximizing existing infrastructure and making best future use of planned infrastructure. Anyone who's not prepared to accept those principles uh, I think we're entitled to treat with skepticism when they talk. Anyone who talks about those principles, I think we need to listen to seriously. Okay, and, and just lastly through the chair. Um, so you, what, what our staff had said is that this is uh, certainly being reviewed. Can you speak to the ask, what is the benefit of specifically uh, uh, looking at what you're proposing if staff is telling us it's already being contemplated? I guess all I can say about that is uh, I didn't know that until I sat down this morning and, and that may be on me. You know, Maybe I should have called Mr. Smith and I should have asked him what the stat, look, look, I don't want to make things difficult for you folks if you've got resistance to directing staff to doing something that they're already doing. I'm not going to ask you to do that. Uh, and if staff says, if Mr. Smith tells me that he's already looking at this and he's going to look at this, I believe him. And I believe that it will happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you and well said. Uh, Councillor Pileschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, Mr. Melling, it's always a pleasure sitting here and listening to you speak uh, so eloquently about uh, 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 something that you're very passionate about, and I mean that sincerely. I, uh, I, I like, uh, you know, you have a way of explaining things that, you know, when it comes down to it, it just, it makes sense. Thank you. I have to tell you, I'm getting a little bit of deja vu here, though, where you've sat before us before, and... I kind of questioned that in the past, why a lawyer is sitting in front of a bunch of politicians. Anybody can insert a joke there now. <laughs> but, you know, something bad had turned out uh, in the end of that where we were all kind of lawyering up to um, go through a process. And the reason why I'm getting a little bit of deja vu here is, 
you know, in the city of Brampton, when we have um, applicants or landowners come before us, it's typically 51% uh, of the landowners form a group, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less, but it's usually the majority of landowners come before us. And then we know that there is, you know, a, a overwhelming desire or a majority of support of a, of a certain parcel of property. And although I don't mind sitting here and listening to a bunch of landowners come before us to squabble over millions and millions of dollars that they're going to make, um, I tell you that we've been down this road before and I would greatly appreciate um, the next time we see each other before, he before here, you represent 51% or whomever represent 51% and there's a landowners group. And that way we're kind of all on the same page and, and, and we're, we're comparing apples to apples. Um, I appreciate your last comments about, you know, staff saying that the work is already being undertaken. So obviously there's no real reason to move forward with any type of motion. I look forward to uh, dealing with that item when it comes, comes back. Um, my only request back to you is, uh, and, and you said, you know, Mr. Gagnon's office could have called you, <clears throat> but you could have called Mr. Gagnon's office or whatever and whomever but just can, can you just get together and, and form the group and uh, look forward to seeing you come back here when you do. Thank you, uh, Councillor, for that. I do wish to say one thing about the process, the previous process to which you refer, and I'll be brief. From the moment I was hired in that process, I went to every one of the lawyers for all of the other parties, and I attempted Well, then I'll say on a go-forward basis in this case, my client's goal is to reach out to all of the major landowners in that area and to notify everyone else in that area and to solicit membership. I hope all members of council realize the difficulty in attempting to assemble a cooperative group where there are 2,000 hectares of land. Uh, we're not talking about a secondary plan area here. We're talking about a major regional urban boundary expansion. But I do take your comments to heart, mm -hmm. Councillor, and I appreciate them. And thank you, and I, I do understand, and, and I'm sure you're aware of, you know, Heritage Heights and the 4,000 hectares of property, but going through the secondary plan, as, as, you, as you indicated. But, and I appreciate the comments of, to uh, referring to last time, but this time, um, let's do it a little bit differently so we're all on the same page. Thank you, Mr. Melling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Thank you through you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Melling, for your presentation. Um, uh, just for the sake of my colleagues, my ward covers the blue half of this picture <laughs> from airport over uh, to the 410 potential ex uh, extension, extension and then beyond. Um, ultimately, I won't belabor the comments of my colleagues. Uh, I, I agree, um, and I think uh, Councillor Pleshi hit on it that uh, moving forward, um, you know, through this process, uh, I would encourage you and your client to engage in that process. Um, as uh, Mr. Gagnon has outlined in his letter, uh, his clients, uh, most of whom are uh, in my area, have um, been part of that process for a number of years. They've been working through the white belt uh, visioning exercises. They've been working through our OP, um, working with staff on a regular basis at the town of Caledon and at the region. Um, and I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, I think that that will go a long way in ensuring that you have um, consensus among all of those landowners. It is a large area. Um, I had a bit of a chuckle just in, in the commenting of knitting together of the Bolton end and the, the Mayfield West end. As you may be aware, it's about a 50 minute drive from one side to the other. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, as you move forward, I would, as, as Mayor Thompson said, invite you to come to Caledon, um, engage with our staff, engage in the process and really be a part of that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Councillor Sinclair. Yes, thank you. Uh, question through you to the delegation. Uh, this overall conceptual scheme is visually simplistic. And I wondered if a professional planner had prepared that or what the background to this uh, drawing is. 
uh, Councillor, the drawing that you see in front of you was in fact prepared by, uh, with the assistance of a professional planner and by his firm, yes? And we sought the input of both a professional planner and a professional growth management consultant, as well as uh, water servicing, sanitary servicing engineers and transportation engineers. Well, I certainly, in terms of Caledon planning, I think the employment blue area should be spread along the, each side of the future GTS, GTA West uh, corridor as an economic corridor and also to buffer noise and pollution from the highway to all uh, residential areas in the future. So I, I just find this entirely uh, too uh, simplistic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there are no other speakers, before I deal with the motion, if I could just um, relay a thought or two with regards to your presentation. And Michael, thank you for your presentation. And, and I will say again, you certainly distinguished yourself to me because unlike so many other lawyers who have clients, you're not the one that just tells your client what they want to hear. When a fair countervailing point has been made, you're always very good at delivering the countervailing point and giving it its due. So I commend you for that, because not all of your peers necessarily do that. Thank you, sir. The challenge that I have had from day one on this file, and I think we're, we're kind of talking around it again, is we seem to be talking about allocation, we seem to be talking about land use, and we seem to be talking about timing. I get that. The problem, it seems to me, has always been, and Councillor Parrish indirectly touched on it earlier, is scarcity. And it's an artificial scarcity. A dega, a Monet painting is scarce because the guy's dead. He ain't making any more of them. Density is not scarce. In Mississauga this week, I read the tremendous news that Oxford Properties is going ahead. What a marvelous project. I'm pretty sure as it was being discussed though, certainly when I was in the room and we approved the Amicon site, when Rogers came forward in my ward, nobody said, well, Rogers doesn't get anything. We gave it all to Amicon. And I wasn't in the room when you gave it to Oxford, but I'm pretty sure by definition, you weren't in the room and saying, well, we can't give Oxford Square One anything. We gave it all to Rogers and Amicon. That's why Amicon and Rogers never complained about Oxford <laughs> and vice versa. And yet we've created this scarcity here, which I tried to address through the minister and the government as most recently as Sunday again, and he didn't use my analogy, but, and he didn't use my words, but I think the minister once again reiterated, you folks are creating the scarcity, we're not, we wanna see shovels in the ground. So now the problem comes back to what you're speaking to, land use and timing. Your land use arguments make a lot of sense to me. So do the, the arguments, though, with regards to Bolton and Mayfield West as well. But that's a planning exercise, and let's undertake that. I agree with that entirely. The challenge my good friend, the Mayor Caledon, has and his colleagues is the timing of how these projects make their way out in a community of 50 or 60,000 people, where I can approve a Rogers for 7,000 units in my ward in Mississauga, that would overwhelm this community overnight. So the timing and the willingness to share was where the problem always comes. And the last thought I will leave is the thought that Councillor Carlson had that was the most cogent one on this entire file. We're getting fed up with billionaires fighting with billionaires over the next billion dollars they're gonna make. And that's what this has been. Billionaires fighting with billionaires over the next hundred million dollars they're gonna make. The most seminal moment I had in all of it was when one of the millionaires, billionaires said, Dana, why are we fighting for over a couple of hundred units? I go, you're fighting over thousands and you want to cannibalize one for the other. And they said, Nana, how many units do you think I can build in a year? And I said, I don't know. I've never built. You give me a phase one, one, two hundred units. It takes me time to bleed that into the marketplace. And my competitors are doing the same. And might you get a thousand units a year from all of us? So a thousand units a year, well, over 20 years, that's 20,000 units can the northern part of the region accommodate that? Well, if it's done, probably, probably yes. But yet they're cannibalizing over a pool of units that are yet to be fully meted out, and nobody's done anything till 1997. 
That is the frustration the chair feels, and I think that's the frustration my colleagues feel, and I think we're getting ready to punt this down the road and say, you know what, if there's no development, all these good people just continue to get reelected. So we need everybody's efforts to get back to the table and discuss the future and say, how can everybody fairly, logically, from land use point of view and timing, share the growth that we need so that our children can buy homes, so that people can age in place. Because these are also the affordable housing units that aren't getting built. <laughs> these are also the condos that aren't getting built. And yet we wonder why our kids can't buy a million dollar home to get started, because we've truncated the supply in an area outside the 80% that should never be built in Priston Cal, where we all agree development should take place. But we created the scarcity and one has to cannibalize the other. So I would hope, I would hope, Everybody, and this is my message really to your, to your um, masters, if you will, and everybody else, you'd better start cooperating a little more because we're fed up here trying to cooperate. I, I convey that on behalf of all my, because with our best of efforts, this ain't going anywhere. And we have a minister that's saying, you don't have scarcity problem. You don't have a process problem. Do you need a municipal zone? Do you need? So that's the message that I would take back before we continue to lawyer up and keep going down the path because I think we've all, had enough of it. I hope I'm saying that on behalf of all of you. Uh, with that, I think our solicitor, <laughs> ironically, perhaps appropriately, Patrick, has a thought before I go to Mayor Thompson. Patrick. Uh, Mr. Chair, just uh, comments if, if the motion remains on the floor. I, uh, is, is that the case currently? And uh, after everybody spoke, as I saw one on my list, part of what I'm hearing is the, most, the, the motion speaks to a process that I think we're undertaking as we speak, and the second point that someone made is, but if we were to single this one out, then suddenly you're gonna have a lot of council meetings like this, where, oh, I wasn't there, and he what about me? And I think we're saying, no, you're all in the tent, just come and give us your land use. So, so I would hope, yeah, that, that we understand, and Mr. Mellon, you may have spoke, I don't wanna put words in your, I think you seem to say, if that process is in place, I don't need a motion here today, but I will, I, I think the lawyer raises a very valid point. The chair needs some clarity as well. Alan, to you, then a final word to Mr. Melling. Alan. No, I was going to go back to Councillor uh, Fortini if he would withdraw it. I think uh, Mr. Melling made it abundantly clear. So if not, we're going to have a dirt storm. We're just going to have every planning organization coming in here. And we have a lot of business to do. And I don't think Mississauga and Brampton want to be listening to Caledon's issues that we're going through an exercise to do. I think Mr. Melling came and made a good presentation, but if, I think if we do this with the motion, we're gonna have everybody coming through the door, and there's many of them, and I think you emphasize that. And Mr. Fortini, I, I, or Councillor Fortini, I, I, I hope you could pull this back, um, because this is a Caledon matter that we're going to work through, and it does affect the region appeal, and I appreciate that, but I don't get involved in, Caledon doesn't get involved in Brampton matters, and we don't get involved in Mississauga matters, and, Please just respect where this is going because with this going forward, I'm going to tell you, it's just going to put salt in wounds and we're going to have everybody in here. Mr. Melling, you've heard the, the plea. What are your thoughts going forward? Your staff have told me that they will consider this proposal and I have told you and will say again, I trust them completely. I also trust you. You've heard what I've said and that is the main purpose of me being here today. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to respectfully disagree with the minister. You did not cause the scarcity problem. The scarcity problem started when the provincial government decided to promulgate fixed numbers for growth for residential and employment and to impose those on municipalities. That is what created the problem. This government has done something very important which is going to change that, which is your decision will either be approved or not approved by the minister and there will be no appeals. So to the extent that the billionaires fight the billionaires, that's gonna be a much faster process than it used to be. Very well said, and with that, I believe what you're also telling me and indirectly to my good friend and colleague, Councillor Fortini, you'd be satisfied if no motion went forward at this time with the comfort that you've received this morning. I am. Okay. 
Pat, last word to you. Given that, will you be satisfied that I think the delegate's happy that we're moving in the appropriate direction? Well, that's fine. If they're very moving, good. That's Thank fine. you. That, that's well done. Okay, I have no other speakers. A very good session. I think that's been very helpful and a step forward. Uh, Mr. Melling, thank you for your presentation. I have receipt of the delegate moved by Councillor Paris, seconded by Councillor Sato. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. That brings me to Delegation 7.3. Sean Meager, Coordinator Ontario for All, regarding the impact of the motion to be presented by Councillor Santos regarding proposed funding cuts to the Ontario Disability Support Ground, a Program related to Item 20.1, which I'll bring forward at this time as well. Uh, Sean, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and thank you for having me here today and thank you for considering this matter. Uh, my name is Sean Maher and I'm the Coordinator of Ontario for All which is a project of the United Way of Peel, Toronto and York Region. And I'm here on behalf of Defend Disability, a coalition of community health centers and legal clinics, community service providers, physicians, and people with lived experience who are recipients of Ontario Disability Supports, um, who work together to support positive public policy on disability. And we're here today to offer our support for the motion before you that encourages the province of Ontario to retain the current definition of disability. As you're no doubt aware, in November of 2018, the former Minister of Children, Community and Social Services announced her intention uh, to change the definition of disability in the Ontario Disability Support Program to align more closely with the federal government guidelines. In the assessment of a wide range of organizations that work with people with disabilities, including your own local community health centers, legal clinics, and service providers here in Peel, this change, if it goes ahead, would have an adverse impact on the health and well-being of many vulnerable people across Ontario and here in Peel. To qualify for ODSP right now, a person can have a disability that is continuous or recurrent as long as it's expected to last a year or more. To qualify under the federal definition, a disability must be essentially permanent or terminal. This change would affect people with episodic disabilities like MS, muscular dystrophy, epilepsy, arthritis, and a range of mental health issues, and would also affect people who have time-limited disabilities such as many forms of cancer and conditions related to living with HIV and AIDS uh, and it would, that might limit their participation in the workforce but not permanently eliminate their capacity to work. Losing disability status for these people would mean being treated by somebody who is employable and has no impediment to finding work. It would mean that the disability supports that they currently rely on would be taken away. Their income would be reduced by 37% and they would lose access to disability related health benefits available under ODSP. This would push very low income people, people already living far below the poverty line, um, into even deeper poverty and in many cases into homelessness. The loss of income and health supports would also have a major impact on their health. The evidence is absolutely clear. Uh, lower incomes is strongly associated with higher rates of morbidity and mortality in most health conditions. These changes would also have a significant impact not only on vulnerable people living with disabilities here in Ontario and here in Peel, but also on the public sector. Changes to the ODSP system to accommodate a new definition would require a complete retooling of the provincial systems that administer it, including the computer systems. People familiar with the provincial social assistance system probably recall how expensive the last retooling was just a few years ago. Conservative estimates run in the tens of millions of dollars. Municipalities should also anticipate considerable new cost. Lowering the income of vulnerable people by 37% will absolutely reduce their capacity to retain and maintain tenancies, resulting in higher rates of homelessness and more pressure on municipal homeless shelters. Moving people off of ODSP and onto Ontario Works will increase the, Ontario, the uh, volume of OW caseloads, but also increase the complexity of those caseloads and put significant pressure on your staff. The federal government themselves have identified that their current definition of disability, the one that is proposed to be adopted by the province of Ontario, is problematic and the new federal minister was specifically tasked with reviewing that definition in the mandate letter issued to the minister by the prime minister uh, uh, late last year. The minister right now in Ontario is still reviewing the proposed change. As that review occurs, several municipalities across Ontario 
including Ottawa, Windsor, London, Hamilton, and Toronto, have already taken the time to encourage the minister to conclude that a new definition of disability would not be in the public interest and is not good public policy. We hope the region of Peel will join them today and offer your support to people living with disabilities all across the region of Peel. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a list. And at first, it, it got bounced around, but I saw Santos, Sato, Groves in that order. But I know somewhere in the red and the green, I'll go with that. Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sean, for coming in today. Um, you approached uh, me back in December about this issue, and we were hoping to get it on the agenda last month, but weren't able to do so. So happy it's here today. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Councillor Groves is going to be seconding the motion. Thank Great. you, Councillor. Um, and as we were working through this motion, we know that other municipalities have joined. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask a question um, to yourself and or staff. Um, what is the impact here in Peel Region? And I, I have the statistics here, but would love for you to vocalize that for us. Um, yes, so the, the statistical information is, is mixed in terms of regional distribution, um, but what we know is that, that at the municipal level, um, there are tens of thousands of people who are all affected um, by this shift. Um, and that, that as people move from ODSP to OW, you can expect them to live in deeper, deeper poverty, uh, have difficulty maintaining tenancies, and arrive at your homeless shelters in considerable numbers, as well as switching to being clients not of provincially administered ODSP, but of municipally administered OW. Um, and as I'm sure your staff will tell you, the challenges with administering OW are both the growth in volume, but also the growth in complexity, and this will dramatically increase the complexity of clients that you're serving. Um, from the client's point of view, from the people who are living with disabilities point of view, we're talking about plunging them to, into a level of poverty that is really quite considerable, that will complicate their conditions and lead to deeper and deeper health problems, which again will land on the public purse as they arrive in hospitals as well as in homeless shelters. And I think there's, a, there's going to be increasing pressure on food bank usage as well. We had a delegation at our last council yeah. about that too. Um, would the commissioner like to add anything? Thank you, and through the chair. I think Mr. Meeker has done a very good job of illustrating the impact to clients, the most, some of the most vulnerable people in our community and to other agencies and how that will affect the municipality. We have been working very hard in Peel Region and as we reported in the budget, we have been able to bring our caseloads down in Ontario Works. Last year, uh, between January and July, we were down by about 9%, which means that we have also been able to make the caseloads more manageable for the caseworkers and to be able to provide better case management. Should we see this change come along, it will mean that caseloads will start to skyrocket again in Ontario Works, definitely impacting on our ability to help people improve the quality of life and move on to you know, other outcomes. So although we do not and would not pay for the increased costs of the cases because that cost has been uploaded to the province, we would be paying more for administration for staff. And there would certainly be a, huge, um, a significant burden on all the other nonprofits and community organization and places of worship who would have to pick up the slack in the change. So um, the motion is before you. I think it was handed out earlier. And I hope to count on everybody's support on this. And thank you, Councillor Gross, for seconding. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. Um, I guess, as, as you've said, the main problem is that the province has looked at the federal definition uh -huh. um, of a disability and is changing based on that. We've had discussion. Um, Councillor Mahoney and I sit on the Accessibility Committee at the city, uh -huh. and we've had a lot of discussion there. And uh, the members are very concerned with the definition being changed to reflect the federal. And uh -huh. in fact, um, their suggestion is that we need to be working towards the federal definition um, as well mm -hmm. to go back to what it used to be before they adopted the World Health Organization and the UN definition of a disability. And I guess you could say that, you know, if you're going to take anything, you take what, what the World Health Organization and the UN call a disability. Um, but as you pointed out, that does not work in practice in uh, as you're dealing with people that have those episodic or um, 
uh, or other um, disabilities like MS, et cetera, which are definitely a disability and which, which should be covered. So while I think that we need to take a look at, um, at the definitions and the descriptions of a disability provincially and not follow, I think it's very important that, that we really stress to the province that we not follow the federal definition. I mean, that is vital right off. But I also think that we should be speaking with our MPs and the ministers at the federal level to point out why using the definition that they are federally, mm -hmm. the impact across Canada on millions of people with these disabilities that, um, that may no longer be, uh, be covered is, um, is a real hardship. And as, as has been said, it impacts all of our other social and health services and the costs for those, which, um, you know, provincially, I mean, the province pays for the health services, so they're going to be paying for it. And we've found in the past that it's always good if you're going to go with an argument to show the cost benefit, because quite frankly, that's all they're looking at right now, provincially, is the dollar signs and what that dollar amount is. So I, I think we should be able to put together, um, as we've done with daycare and uh, as it relates to Ontario works costs, et cetera, to show that if this segment of our population loses their support, what the overall cost will be in the other supports of health and social service and, and uh, Ontario works, um, et cetera, if they're losing that. And I think if you did that provincially, I mean, we could do it here in Peel, that's, that's all we can do. But I think if you took that across the board provincially, it would probably come out to a lot more than what they're going to save. Mm -hmm. And I really think that if, we, if we're going to put a very strong argument forward, um, I think we need all of the municipalities in Ontario, and I guess AMO would be the one to be able to pull together the provincial numbers. So I, I really think that that's, um, and I, I think that might require an, a bit of an amendment to your motion. Mm -hmm. um, just asking them not to do it because is one thing. But let's really get the facts and let's show, show the provincial representatives um, a very strong argument that is going to show um, financially what the impact could be. We all know what the impact is going to be emotionally, socially, and, and physically, really, on the people that are going to lose this service. Um, we, we deal with it through our committees all the time and with our residents all the time. Um, but I, I don't think, uh, well, I know that <laughs> provincially um, it doesn't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But I also think that mm -hmm. uh, as a side, mm -hmm. that while working on this provincially, um, I think we need to gather, and, and I'll look at you for that, um, I think we really need to gather some arguments to look at it federally as well. And, you know, sit down, maybe, we, we need to find a champion. I mean, that's really the thing, is you need to find a champion among the uh, federal MPs that is willing to take a look at this. Because I don't think the, uh, federally it has been looked at for many years. It's just mm -hmm. been there, let's adopt the WHO and the UN. And, and yet it's funny because the definition on the federal website actually states episodic. And then they go on after that to say, but we're using the UN definition. So if you took the first part of the definition of a disability from the federal government's website, then it does apply to the people who would prevent, uh, potentially be losing their, uh, their subsidies provincially. So I, I'd suggest that maybe we use that wording mm -hmm. in anything, any letters that go to the province and kind of skip by what the WHO and the UN says and, and use the uh, federal's own wording. On that point, Commissioner Sheehy. Thank you very much through the chair. I think you're making excellent points, uh, Councillor Sato. I think what you're seeing is motions that are very general in nature because the province has been short on details. 
So they have made these announcements, but there are so many questions. What will actually be the definition of a disability? Uh, when will it be implemented? Will it be phased in? They have committed to grandfathering, but we're not quite sure what we know grandfathering means. Does that mean someone who's on ODS, ODSP today or someone whose application has already been received. So we are very challenged with coming up with tangible numbers and trying to model the actual impact at this time. It, and, sorry, if, if I could just comment on that. However, the province has thrown out some numbers and I don't think we should be, you know, things happen quickly with this government. And if I, th I think, look, you know, from our discussions at our accessibility advisory committees, I think we should be able to get some of those numbers because you know roughly the number of people that this is going to impact. And you may not be able to get exact dollar figures, but, you know, I, and I really think AMO needs to do, AMO really needs to do some work on this because they have all the staff that can pull, to get, pull that together. And to get all of the municipalities on board and, and go to AMO and say, look, you need to take this up. You're working on that, on, on the Government Relations Committee. Okay, good. Because I think that's, it, it has to be provincial. It has to be province-wide. And, you know, people need to know what this is, what the impact is going to be. And, you know, I, I, I don't, I think if we don't use some financials, it's going to be ignored. That. Thank you, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sean, for your delegation. And I was happy to, uh, to second the motion that Councillor Santos has. Um, we already are having an issue with homelessness here in Peel Region. We already have an issue with not enough affordable housing for uh, these individuals. I would hate to see funding taken away from these very vulnerable individuals and have them on the streets. Um, and, and again, and I think Councillor Sato made a good point that, you know, the province comes out with these announcements and really I'm not sure that there's any, there's much thought put into the, the impacts that it would have. And to Councillor Sato's point as well, the overall impacts on all of our services that we provide here in Peel region, and not just here in Peel, but in the hospitals as well. Because these folks, if they don't have the financial means to support themselves, it leads to a whole lot of other health issues. Some of these folks might not be able to have uh, food. And food, as we know, nutrition is a huge part of being healthy. And I can tell you, I, I sit on the accessibility committee here, and I, I also work with a lot of individuals in my community who have different types of disabilities. And already, they are not getting enough money to survive on. And if some of us around this table really knew what these people are surviving on, there is no way that any of us here could survive on that. And to decrease that by 37%, it just baffles me. Because I can tell you, the other thing, the other challenge for these individuals are the caregivers. Hmm. Caregivers are burning out. Hmm. What happens to those uh, individuals once those caregivers are no longer around. So I, I have a real problem with this. And Councillor Sato, to your point, it's a much bigger issue. We're already getting funding cuts here at the region. And we're already working on a very meager, very tight budget to accommodate growth and, and everything else that keeps increasing in this region. So thank you again for coming forward, for speaking up on behalf of these very vulnerable individuals because they do need um, an advocate. And Councillor Santos, thank you for bringing this motion forward. And I think all of us need to advocate on behalf of these individuals and be their voices and, and be very firm with the province. Yeah. You're cutting their income, which is not enough, is way below the poverty line by 37%. What are these people supposed to do? How are they to live? 
Thank you. A last word to the mover of the motion, Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I think Councillor Sato and I have come up with a friendly amendment, number four, and uh, the clerk has the amendment now, which will cover some of the important points that Councillor Sato had mentioned. Very good, and I have it before the chair now, but you have it on the screen. I'm gonna take it as read by Councillor Santos and Councillor Groves. Um, in fact, it's so important that I'll just run through it quickly. Whereas the province of Ontario has announced its intention to cut $1 billion from the Ontario Works Program and the Ontario Disability Support Program. And whereas the province of Ontario proposes to narrow the definition of what constitutes a disability under the Ontario Disability Support Program. And whereas such changes would cause significant financial hardship for individuals and families in receipt of such programs and further would result in a need for a higher level of supports to be provided by municipalities and the community. Therefore, be it resolved that the regional chair write on behalf of Regional Council to the Minister of Children, Community Services and Social Services, urging the Ministry to one, reverse its plans to cut $1 billion from the Ontario Disability Support Program and Ontario Works Program, two, maintain the current definition of disability under the Ontario Disability Support Program, and three, increase the social assistance rates in both subject programs to improve the quality of life of some of the most vulnerable members of our community. And further, that the Government Relations Committee make this a priority for Association of Municipalities of Ontario to provide financial analysis on the impact. You've heard the motion, Madam Clerk, a recorded vote? Yes. Recorded vote. That carries unanimously. Thank you. And thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. Now, I just have to deal with administrative matter. 8-2 would have been Dr. Hopkins, but I think I'm going to go to you next because, ironically, you're going to give us an update on the coronavirus, and you have to be somewhere at 11.30 for an update on the coronavirus. So why don't you take a moment now, then we'll come back to 8.1. Please proceed, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you so much, Chair. So I wanted to provide Council with a timely update on the work that we are doing here at Peel Public Health to prepare for the risk of novel coronavirus here in Peel. So I think it's really important for you to keep in mind that there are currently no known cases of the virus in Canada, and the overall risk in Ontario and Peel is rated as low at present. So on December 31st, health authorities became aware of a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan City in China. And new cases have been discovered daily. As of earlier today, there are over 600 suspected cases and 17 deaths. And cases and deaths are unfortunately expected to rise. Most cases are in China, and there are only a few cases beyond China's borders, including one case in the United States. However, given the ease of global travel, cases are expected to be seen in Canada, including in Peel. So I'll give you a bit of background about the illness itself. Coronaviruses are a very large family of viruses, um, and they cause symptoms similar to the common cold to very severe illness. So people with severe illness have fever, cough, shortness of breath, and they can develop pneumonia. Coronaviruses pass between animals and people. And when it's just passing between animals and people, um, it doesn't tend to spread that easily. It's only when it starts to transmit better between people that we have to be really concerned about it. Right now, person-to-person -person spread is limited. However, we are early in the outbreak, so this is continuing to be closely monitored. So what can we do to protect ourselves? The best way to prevent the spread of any respiratory virus, including novel coronavirus, is to stay home if you're sick, to stay away from other people who are ill with respiratory viruses, to cover your coughs and your sneezes with your sleeve, and to make sure that you're washing your hands with alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. I think many of you will remember SARS, and that's often something that's come up during the discussion of this novel coronavirus. We've learned a lot since that time, that was back in 2003, and public health and the healthcare sector has certainly improved and advanced with respect to emergency planning. The virus, this novel coronavirus, is already sequenced. That means that testing is available. That's something that took many months previously with SARS. Public health agencies are now communicating globally and we're receiving uh, information very regularly from China. Ties have been strengthened with local health sector partners and there are protocols that have been developed that allow us to respond more rapidly. 
So what we're doing here in Peel is we're working with the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Ministry of Health, Public Health Ontario, and other local health providers to monitor the situation and take actions as appropriate. Yesterday, the province amended regulations to make this a mandatory reportable disease to local public health units. This is a very helpful step because this means that all uh, suspect cases and confirmed cases must be reported to Peel Public Health, and that means we're able to respond very quickly to make sure that they are managed appropriately and limit spread. <laughs> Yesterday, Pearson International Airport also implemented enhanced travel screening. That includes information on signs for travelers returning from Wuhan, China, um, as well as travel questions on the kiosks. And so that means that uh, quarantine officers may be involved if anyone is identified with potential illness. We're also actively working with partners in paramedics and hospitals to ensure appropriate identification and investigation of patients suspected to have novel coronavirus. And we'll be expanding these efforts to work with other health sector partners as further information and guidance is provided by the Public Health Agency of Canada, Ministry of Health and Public Health Ontario. We also understand that the province will be conducting public education and information through media outlets. I will continue to keep regional council as well as Peel residents informed of important information and continue our collaborative efforts with other health system partners. I'd be happy to take questions, Chair. Any quick questions for the Officer of Health before she has to run? Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Sato, go ahead. Thank you. Um, do, is there something that we can post that I know you sent us an email with information which is pretty lengthy. Um, it, could you provide us with something that we can uh, use in our social media newsletters to give, I, I guess, a short version of the um, measures of protection that are being put in place? Uh, through the chair, I'm happy to provide that to councillors. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess we'll just move receipt of that presentation. Councillor Sato, Councillor Rass, all those in favour, that is carried. Thank you. That brings us to our final staff presentation, 8-1, Psychological Health and Safety at the Region of Peel Update, presentation by Don Langtree, Director, Strategic Policy and Initiatives. Welcome, Don. Okay, through the chair. I'm Dawn Langtree. Next week on January 29th, it's Bell Let's Talk Day. So we thought it would be helpful to give you an update on psychological health and safety here at the region. As a reminder, we reported last fall on paramedic services. Remember Mandy's story. This presentation speaks to our broader corporation efforts. So why is this important? We're in a constant state of change. Changes brought on by social media, climate change, artificial intelligence, global unrest, leading to uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, volatility. It's our new normal. This seems to be affecting the mental well-being of people. In fact, for us, mental health continues to be one of the leading causes of disability claims and the highest emerging issue for our employee and family assistance program. This is an important issue for staff. It impacts absenteeism and presenteeism. We also have a legal obligation under the Occupational Health and Safety Act to take every precaution reasonable in circumstances for the protection of workers. This protection includes psychological health. This together with our ethical responsibility as part of our corporate social responsibility strategy provides for the why. Globally, mental health has become a prominent issue. For example, Britain has a ministry of loneliness New Zealand introduced a well-being budget. The World Health Organization just declared burnout as an official syndrome. And here in Canada, nearly 500,000 people that we know of in any given week 
are unable to work due to mental health challenges, leading to the creation of a national standard for psychological health and safety. And as you know, there is one specifically for paramedics. These are world-renowned and evidence-based and have guided our human resources planning. They are founded on prevention, promotion, and resolution. There are three key things to note. First, the standards include 15 workplace factors, two specific for paramedics, that can affect mental well-being. When we understand these connections, we can become mindful of them, applying empathy. They range from recognition to civility and respect to clear leadership and expectations. Second, physical safety is one of these factors. Our goal is to make all of them important. Just as we as a society have learned the importance of staying physically safe, we need to do the same for our mental well-being. Finally, the two paramedic factors, cumulative exposure to critical and stressful events and other chronic stressors are important as they can be, contribute to PTSD and other issues. What's interesting is we found that these factors play out in other parts of our organization through vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue. For example, our caseworkers, housing workers, public health nurses who come in contact with people, experience, people or families experiencing domestic violence or people with mental health and addiction challenges, or are folks delivering direct client service through community access, the call center, or our way scale operators, who often experience incivility and disrespectful behavior, or our long-term care personal support workers and nurses, who on a day-to-day -day basis care for those with dementia. And these are just a few examples. We also learned there is varied understanding about mental health and the fact that it exists across a continuum or dual continuum. Not understanding this contributes to negative views and stigma. Also, there is low awareness of how the 15 factors play out. This leads to a belief by some that this is not within our control. Another finding is that related data is difficult to collect, which creates measurement gaps. This pre prevents us from getting a full picture of the employee experience. We learned, though, that we're not alone. Others like us face similar challenges despite the comprehensive programs and policies in place, which made us wonder why, so we went deeper. Consider this statistic from the Canadian Mental Health Commission. It can lead us to believe a couple of things, that we can easily separate life and work, and that 60% refers to time at work in a physical place, when actually, it means time spent working. Realistically, as we all know, work and life are linked. Consider my example and imagine your own early morning. I wake up and I check my phone. I know I'm not alone in doing that. I have a coffee, I go for a run or walk. I come up with some of my best ideas at that time. I capture them, get ready, and fight traffic. Some of us are checking in on parents. Others are rushing to get our kids to school on time. And with five generations in our workforce, just how life and work integrate is very different for everyone. Appreciating this is a more accurate picture of our lives today. 
So we learned we can't implement the standard alone. The one factor we can't forget is the human factor. This means that we can't checkbox our way through this. The 15 factors are not mutually exclu exclusive. One factor may be connected to any number of other factors in an endless sequence of personal experiences. Add to that the need to appreciate all of our dimensions of diversity. As a colleague in paramedics put it, if we don't appreciate or recognize the human factor, it would be like offering a black and white solution to a rainbow problem. So there's a reason why this is so hard. Historically, work was never intentionally designed to see people. In fact, people were considered extensions of machines. So today, and in future, the design of workplaces are shifting to recognize the value of people in the way that work is done. So changes need to be made to protect the minds of workers in an environment that was never really intentionally designed for this. If we don't rec realize our work structures and processes need to adapt, then absenteeism and staff retention could be impacted. This is really about shifting how we think to appreciating and supporting the whole person whose lives are shaped both in and out of work. So, practically speaking, to help us move forward with all of that context in mind, a framework was realized. It has three elements, me, we, and us. Me is about empowering all of us to take control of our own mental well-being. Actions, in addition to what we're already doing, like our respectful workplace program or employee and family assistance program, will include creating and adapting supportive platforms for people to share their stories and access information. We is about identifying and removing hazards within our control in the workplace. Our actions will include alignment of policies and programs to allow for better data collection, build more awareness and understanding using learning tactics like leadership development and mental health first aid training. Us is our role as an anchor institution to support community capacity for better mental health including advocacy efforts as part of our health system integration committee's leadership and the development of the community safety and well-being plan. Key principles moving forward as we continue to implement actions are that this work is not seen as an add-on. It will be embedded in how we work, how we lead, and how we deliver our services. It's not one program's responsibility. It's owned by all of us. It's about understanding our own unique businesses and cultures, being kind to ourselves, and treating people how they want to be treated. We can't escape the complexity of this, but together we can make the invisible, the mental well-being of all of us, visible and ultimately create environments where we can do our best work. Thank you. Thank you and well said. Um, Councillor Sinclair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through to the delegation. I see you've got, uh, I guess it's uh, point 14 and 15 in the tables, uh, specifically dealing with paramedics. And uh, there's a mention of a road to mental health, mental readiness program. And uh, then the other points there about uh, Peel Aligned Initiative seem to be a bit mechanical. And I thought what we heard directly from the paramedics last fall was that they definitely needed extra attention beyond their supervisors and beyond their peers. 
Is that uh, covered in the program or is that something we should be looking at? It is covered, yes. We're looking at it holistically. And uh, Peter, um, our Chief Dundas, is looking at it more integratedly within his program as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Uh, Councillor Sinclair brought up a good point, and it was interesting. Um, and I know this is still part of us. I know it's Peel, but it's also the Peel Regional Police. Is there anything there that covers the off the, our police officers as well? Because it seems that we're at, we are getting some senior management that are taking leave of this. You know, everybody they're helping everybody below them, but it's it's like like the paramedics. It's like the fire. It's all a hierarchy, and who's helping the the top guy? I would agree. And part of the sort of us category is that we are going to try to share what we've learned with the rest of the community, which would include the police. Um, it, this particular um, sort of overall strategy is for the region. Go ahead, uh, through the CAO. Just to add to Don, uh, through the chair, to add to Don's um, response, um, having spoken to the chief of police, they do have a comprehensive psychological health and wellness program. However, there is always room for growth and improvement. So he is spending a lot of time not only with the commissioners, but also with Chief Dundas to determine how to further improve it and to share these learnings. <laughs> so there's certainly open, openness and willingness for those discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a motion moved by Ras and Downey that the psychological health and safety framework as outlined in section two and appendix two of the report from the Acting Commissioner of Corporate Services titled Psychological Health and Safety at the Region of Peel Update be endorsed. Um, show of hands vote. Do I need a record? Recorded vote. I need a recorded vote. If you'd push your button accordingly, please. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, that concludes delegations and staff presentations. Before I go to individual committees, I was remiss at the beginning of the meeting. Oh, and by the way, and it explains why I've been bumping into ministers. I had the pleasure on Sunday and Monday to be downtown for the Roma Conference, Rural Ontario Mayors. And I really got to shout out and single out Mayor Thompson, who is the chair of the organization. What a marvelous presentation you folks put on. Was it 1,400 of our leaders from abroad? Actually, 15 is. 1,518. Uh, I tell you, the high watermark was uh, the Premier spoke to us Monday morning. I think Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock, they put together a panel to answer questions from all of the delegates. All 22 cabinet ministers were on the podium. All of cabinet showed up and for 90 minutes took questions of any kind from the crowd. It was very well done. And I know I bumped into Joanna Downey there and Madam Mayor, Mayor Crombie, I know you, even though you're under the weather, you were there on behalf of some advocacy as well. So well done to all. But to you, Al, what a great job that was done and a nice time in the corridors to talk to some of our colleagues in government and continue to be advocates for Peel and our community. So, so well done and thank you. With that, we're on to item nine. Items related to public works. Councillor Groves, if you would chair. And, uh, and I see that's going to be a bit of a problem because she's not in her chair. Uh, Councillor Fortini, okay, why don't I, uh, otherwise I'll take, but I'll give them one moment to see if we can rustle them up. Thank you, Bonnie. So, Councillor Fortini, I don't know if Annette's right behind you, but otherwise you're going to chair item nine, items related to public works as vice chair. Councillor Fortini, if you could chair this meeting for us. But, oh, sorry, and here we are. Councillor Groves has just arrived. With regards to item nine, Councillor Groves, if you could chair the public works agenda, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I had an emergency with my mom. Um, we have before you under uh, items of communication, it was held by Mayor Thompson and it's item 10.2. It's a letter from Mayor Thompson regarding automated speed enforcement implementation. Oh, 
Oh, Councillor Parrish, I'm sorry. Yes, I just, uh, <laughs> congratulations on uh, implementing the speed enforcement, but just wanted to check. Uh, Mississauga and Brampton pay for their own ASC cameras. Is this just for the regional roads and you'll be paying for your own ASC cameras? This is a neat, unique one here where we are on this one. This is the reason why we had to go through the ministry is it's the provincial highway, so we had to work with the province of Ontario. Uh -huh. This is this is a, like a really one-off. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I just need a show of hands, or it just goes. Okay, all those in favor, that is carried, and that concludes this section of the agenda. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and there are no items related to health that were held, so that brings me to item 13, items related to human services. Councillor Medeiros. Oh, no, uh, and, and I apologize. Yeah, I, I was, even you've already <laughs> dealt with that. I was you, thinking to myself, either I didn't well, pay attention. That I it was a trick question. <laughs> no, but the fact both of those have already been knocked off, which brings me to item 15, items relating to planning and growth that Councillor Pileshi will chair at this time. Chair Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I saw the one item that was put into uh, consent, and the other item wasn't... Uh, requested, so it's just a letter re of correspondence. It went into consent. 15 1 went into consent. Nobody wished to pull it. So, before you, members of uh, council, you have a letter of correspondence from Ganyan Walker Domes on behalf of the Mayfield East Landowners Group, letter dated January 22nd. Uh, can I get uh, mover, Councillor Downey, seconded by Councillor Innes. All in favor? Carries. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Brings us down to items related to enterprise programs and services. Chair Fonseca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 17.2, uh, terms of reference for the preparation of a report on police funding allocations was held by Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, With all due respect, I don't think these... Um, Terms of reference bear any connection at all to the motion that uh, I moved, nor did they pay, pay any attention to the motion that was actually passed by this council. I wasn't at the meeting. I'd like to substitute another motion, please. That a steering committee of CAOs and CFOs be reconstituted with sufficient support staff from each lower tier municipality in the region to review the policing policy options as considered in the ENY report and any other sources of relevant data and further, a consultant be hired to do technical analysis if the steering committee feels such assistance is necessary to complete the study and prepare a report for regional council. I want to take the politics out of it, put the staffs back into it, and uh, have them report back to us. It's not going to be a lot of money. We've already paid 600000 for Ernst & Young, and I think our CFOs and CEOs, CAOs did a really good job on that whole exercise. So I'd like to send it back to them. These terms of reference pay absolutely no, they won't work. I, I can hear them coming back and saying, no, nobody's going to give you their data and it's too much work and it's going to take seven years. And I think we just reconstitute the committee we had before that worked so well and it'll be done quickly and efficiently. Okay, thank you, Councilor Parrish. So this is a motion, correct? Is there, yes, I have it here if somebody wants to Is there a way to, to the get screen? it on the board? And while that is happening, we would need a seconder. Seconded by Mayor Crombie. And Mayor Crombie is next on the board to speak. I was just going to thank Carolyn for this initiative and say that, I'm sorry for my voice again. Um, the, the, the report that was brought back by our staff is pretty vague and it talks about a SWOT analysis. Um, and I think that there is some existing work that has been done, but I think the lower tiers need to be engaged, not just the staff here at the region. So the simplest way to do it would be to reconstitute the working committee that worked with uh, you know, the, uh, the governance issues. So I, I support this fully, and I hope everyone will as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have the chair on the board. Thank you. And my question is just one of procedure and process, and maybe the CAO wanted to speak to the same thing. Um, it is the police function. There is a police services board. They respond to regional council and regional council only, but now you're going to have the other municipalities 
get involved in that. I just want to make sure that's a framework no, 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 that's not. appropriate under the circumstances. But I think the CAO, I just want to make sure we get it right that, that I don't go back to the police service. Really. What do you guys think you're doing? And I just want to make sure we're properly constituted. And I don't know if the CAO had a similar thought. Okay. And it, is it possible to get the motion on the board? I think that might be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Nancy. And, and I'd like to add, even though Caledon isn't Peel Regional Police, I think they should be at the table to watch what's going on and to contribute. So through the chair, um, just for some context, what you have before you certainly is a framework um, that we wanted to bring to council. Based on the motion that was left on the table, and certainly there was lots of conversation that happened around this table on the topic, but based on the original motion, that referral that came back to staff spoke specifically to police allocation. Um, and that's why what you see here in its context is um, a framework that speaks solely to police allocation. We did not speak to EY or any of that. It really was to go out fresh, look at what evidence we have before us, whether it be through other models, so OPP or other models that may exist that are policing models. Um, and certainly the other component is being able to work in you know, a, a neutral, ob objective area where you're starting fresh. There are consultants that definitely speak and work in this realm that are um, exclusive and they have the expertise that council would want um, on this topic. Um, and the goal for staff is to not come to council one time, but certainly bring council on board and come periodically so that the conversations can continue to be had around this table and at the end of June, have the opportunity to bring for, before you data, analysis of data, certainly not recommendations. Those are for you as regional council to discuss in preparation for uh, budget. And if I still have the floor, Madam Chair, this, these two don't preclude each other. I'm just organ trying to organize it so that it comes back to the same non-political efficient group we had before. They can take all of this that you've done uh, and I, I think they can streamline it and everybody can work together and come back with a, a good report. As you say, staff probably wouldn't want to make a recommendation. I think what they want to do is come back with a report that uh, they present all options to us. So I, I think it's a complimentary thing. I don't think it's... I, I just looked at this and I thought this is going to take forever and let's, let's snap this into something that already worked once. Okay. Thank you. We have further speakers. Uh, Mayor Brown. I would just say I don't think it's necessary to reference the Ernst & Young. I think you could uh, take that out and just say review the policing policy options. Um, I, I, we certainly felt the Ernst & Young uh, discussion on the policing models was flawed. I know that was the technical um, feedback we got at the city of Brampton. Um, <coughs> And so I, I wouldn't want them continuing down the road of comparing the region appeal to a, a rural area. Um, and so I, I, if you want to have agreement uh, and give flexibility to what the, um, I, on, on what the review should be, I, I obviously think this is un, unnecessary. Um, but if we're going to do it, um, then um, it shouldn't be tied to what was initially a flawed uh, um, assessment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Medeiros. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess to the mover, and I say this, when we talk about a steering committee, um, I'm not, again, I won't speak, and our mayor just spoke, but when we're committing resources from our municipality for an objective and a direction that was given predominantly by another municipality that seeks information, uh, you're really compromising uh, because at the City of Brampton, we just went yesterday, uh, we're going over an official plan. We declared a, a health care emergency. We have our CAO stretched everywhere. Um, so the, the idea of City of Brampton giving our resources to help Mississauga, I guess, seek the information they seem, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's contemplated. I'd like to see some form of 
a, a, a work plan, what timelines we're expecting, uh, because you know what, what troubles me is when I hear that they want to get the information quicker. They don't want it to be, well, it, you know, to be quite frank, this is not a priority at the city of Brampton right now. Uh, city of Brampton, we have tons of priorities. So to commit our senior uh, 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 executive team, I'm not sure if it's, you know, we can approve it here, but do we have the opportunity for us to discuss it at the city of Brampton? Because we really have, uh, we have a mayor who uh, is a force of nature and is very ambitious and we have a, uh, an agenda that we want to fulfill. So I'm, I'm just not sure uh, at this stage what type of commitment that uh, uh, we're being asked to participate in. And especially with the end result, is not something really that you know Council of Brampton really uh, agrees with. So, and and then after regarding the consultant to be hired, I'd like to see the financials uh, of what we're contemplating as well. And and I don't have that information here, so I, I'm not, you know, I'm not comfortable saying uh, uh, to be hired. I'd like to see uh, what the costing would be. Uh, I'd be more comfortable uh, in that language. And uh, you know, I think we, I think all of us want to ensure that we're not just throwing good money uh, at a situation where uh, I'm not sure what the objective is, especially when the final decision is not with, uh, does not lie with this council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I do see Patrick on the board. Patrick, would you like to speak to the comments here? Yes. Oh, sorry, Patrick O'Connor. <laughs> Patrick O'Connor. If, if I'm speaking directly to this ahead of Mayor Brown. If I might just suggest, Madam Chair, for, for enhanced clarity, I think it's consistent with the intention that there be a, re a specific reference to uh, allocation of policing costs as opposed to the use of the term policing policy because an external person reading this, I think, could be confused by policing policy is an extremely broad <laughs> concept. I, uh, I think it should be focused on, uh, I think it's intended to be focused on allocation of allocation, costs. Allocation, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, and back to the board, uh, Mayor Brown. And I, I have um, sympathy for what Councilor Medeiros was saying, that obviously our CO and CFO are, are busy with the, uh, local agenda we have, and, and I'm sure it would be acceptable uh, that if it's a CEO or a representative uh, of the CEO, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the CEO. I, I assume that's the, the word smithing. We could have someone else designated from the city to make sure that the the steering committee is, is uh, that the consultant uh, that is hired is agreeable with all three municipalities. Um, I would reiterate that I, I don't believe, I think this is gonna be a cost that's not necessary, but obviously, um, a slim majority of regional council felt that this was uh, worth um, the cost. Um, and so despite the fact we voted against that, uh, um, if they're gonna do this report, uh, it should certainly be someone that's agreed to by the three municipalities. And so uh, better to be in the tent than outside the tent in terms of making sure that it's fair and uh, and equitable, I would note, you know, I would expect everything to be looked at. And so whether that's uh, the, the airport uh, uh, cost, if there's any um, subsidy or any cost associating with overlooking them, because obviously we, we spend time um, looking at, uh, at their budget, the marine unit, I think everything's on the table. And because we haven't specified what it's limited to, um, then uh, we could get a report that's more um, equitable. I don't think there's anything in this that constrains what they could look at in terms of the allocation of cost. Would that be your reading, uh, Patrick? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Parrish? Well, that would be usually, um, they say a racehorse, uh, or a camel is a racehorse designed by a committee. But this, in this case, I think we're, we're melding it into something that we're all going to cooperate with and, and it's going to work for all of us. So in this case, it's fine to have all the amendments. And I thank Patrick, as always, for his astute observations. Um, as long as you're happy assigning someone to take the place of your CAO, we're good. I'm good with that. And I'm sure no one else is going to mind. You'll choose carefully, and as far as the consultant's concerned, that will have to meet with the approval of all the municipalities and the region. So I'm good with it. Okay. So. Thank you. Hello. 
I like that song. <laughs> you got us singing it. Um, thank you. And and just to comment, I wasn't going to comment on this, Mayor Brown, but you said it that it passed with a slim majority of council, slim majority representing the majority of the population of the region of Peel, and the biggest municipality within the region of Peel. So. Uh, while it's a slim majority, it represents the bulk of the population. Um, I was going to suggest, and, and if, if Brampton's fine with it still saying chief administrative officers and chief financial officers, but um, if that's a problem for, for the members from Brampton, that uh, we just say that um, the municipalities be requested to assign staff to sit on a steering committee with regional staff, and then the municipality decides whether it's chief administrative officers and chief financial officers. I know it says, are there designates, but I'm not sure you need to be that specific with, um, with the positions if you just leave it up to staff, because there may be more appropriate staff that could sit on the committee. But if Brampton's fine with the wording as it is now, then that's okay. But uh, that was why I was on the board, was just to make that suggestion. Okay, thank you for those comments. Um, I do have the regional chairs on the board, but just from a, looking to clerks from a, a process standpoint. So this motion is here first, but then we still have to deal with the actual report, correct? They're separate. Or is, is this replacing, this is, refer the report to the committee, okay. So we will do the deal with this first, and then the report. Okay, regional the regional chairs on the board. Thank you, and, and maybe I'll take this opportunity. Um, and this is one of the difficulties when we get motion right on the floor of council, and we've got to think it through. It'd be more helpful if we could get them in advance, as our policy allows for and calls for. But you have nobody from the police in the room, so if you need data, who are you going to get your data information? No. Okay, but hold on, but don't you want their understanding of what their funding might be, how it's apportioned? I'm, I'm asking. No, no, no. Oh, Okay, as long as you're mindful of that. Okay, as I said, nice to get these in advance so that we can, might have been something I might have liked to have asked my friends at the police board, but okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Parrish, back, yeah, well, you're back on board. In addressing what the chairs just said, it would be very nice if we got our stuff in advance. I get stuff on a Tuesday afternoon yeah. that's like the Melling report. I had to call and say, are we, are we getting the slides? I think it's getting sloppier and later all the time. And if you want my stuff quickly, how about you get your staff to get our stuff out quickly? I'm getting tired of getting stuff at the last minute. My office is scrambling to redo the agendas. I think the agenda should be out the Thursday before a meeting, and you're going to get all my motions in gold, bronzed if you want them. Okay, and if I could respond, I'm welcome to hear that, but what you're asking for is to amend the policies that you've approved in the past before, and not that different from the ones I lived with for 30 years in Mississauga. Well, we can do that at, at our committee okay, meeting so next let's, week. so yes. let's not be hypocritical about it. It's what we've always done. It's what the policy is, and it's what Mrs. Dog has done for the 30 years that I was there, just to be clear in fairness to my staff. Thank you. So that could from ho come forward in a separate motion, so. Okay, thank you. So seeing no one further on the board, we do have the motion before you, and this is a recorded vote. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Still people voting. <coughs> now I believe everybody has voted. And it passes. Thank you very much. Now back to the report 17.2. Uh, we need a motion to refer the report to the committee. Councillor Parrish. Okay. Thank you. Looking to clerks, this does not have to be in a formal motion, just a show of hands. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, on to item 17.3, options to maintain Mississauga's vote during a member's absence. Councillor Sato. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so I was a little confused when I saw the, uh, the report here and because council has already approved the motion that was passed by the procedures committee um, that we proceed with doing this, that we undertake the process and also, and I think this is the most important part, um, and, and I was aware, I, I got a copy of this from staff, thank you, um, because I'd moved it at the committee, that we are not prepared to wait until the, the next uh, term of office. And in Mississauga, we passed a motion that we are requesting the province to amend the legislation as we are the only municipality in Ontario that is not covered under it to um, enable us to have the same rights as every other municipality within the province. So I think the important part of the motion that council already passed is that the province of Ontario be requested to enact such legislation to take effect during the current term of council, notwithstanding section 219 of the act. Council has already approved that um, so we don't need to do it again. So my understanding when I spoke with staff is that this report is really only to, um, to advise us legally that we have to request that of the province and at the same time go through the process so that in case the province does not amend the act, at least it would take place in the next term of office. So um, I, I think that's the legal part of it. And I guess there was a discussion about whether it should be awaited, which um, we actually hadn't discussed at our committee. Uh, we were talking about um, requesting the same uh, process of appointing one person from our council uh, as every other municipality has and not really muddying the water. I think your um, explanation of how complicated a weighted vote would be it's very clear to me that I don't think that's the way that we, we want to go. I think it just would, you know, you could have a vote separated by 0 0.091 of a vote, which is a little bit ridiculous and just doesn't seem to be the way. So I would suggest that we just continue on with uh, leaving the motion that was already approved by the committee, approved by council, and receive this as, uh, as background information. So I'd move receipt and just let things proceed, and uh, staff have advised me that they're already working on the bylaw and all of the process, so I really appreciate that, that our staff are, are expediting this and moving as quickly as you possibly can to make it happen, so thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sato. Mayor Crombie. So I did have the opportunity to speak to the minister and the premier on this issue, and what we need is an orders in council, Councillor Sato. So maybe, I don't know if you want a motion or direction to staff that we write a letter requesting the orders in council so that this can be completed in a timely way. No, it's not, let's not say that here. I don't have the previous motion in front of me, Councillor Sato, so. Okay, okay. So if it's not necessary, it's not necessary. So I. Right. Mayor Crum, I think what Councilor Shado was explaining is that, yeah, this was already, it was already put. And do we specifically request the orders in council? It, uh, I don't occur. know if we need staff or Councilor Shado. Maybe, maybe I can just read what it says, Mayor Crombie. It didn't say specifically orders in council. That's it what's said required. that, um, and enhance granting the city of Mississauga further that the province of Ontario be requested to enact such legislation as would be required, which would be the order of council, to authorize that a bylaw enacted by the council of the region of Peel, granting the city of Mississauga an enhanced voting member to take effect during the current term of council, notwithstanding section 219 of the act. Okay. So I think that wording covers, it didn't specifically yes, it refer to the process. No, it covers it. And but what, it was whatever needs to be done. And what is the status of this letter to the Premier? So through to staff, Councillor Sato had explained that there is, this is already in process with staff. 
Kids who's staff. Can, who can speak to it, Madam Chair? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we, we have not made that request as yet, but it will be made in conjunction with bringing the entire process forward as a whole so that there's something to found the request on. Uh, a, a council uh, process will be initiated. Uh, as you know, it takes the no notice, the public meeting, the triple majority. Once that gets started, and it is a priority to start it, uh, the request for legislation will accompany that. Does this not begin that process? And that motion not begin that process? I, I think it's fair to say that Council's direction is sufficient to get us going on, on making the request, and, and we, we should do that sooner rather than later. So what's the timeline? <coughs> For the entire process? How about when we begin it? <laughs> well, you have begun the process. Okay. Uh, writing a letter, we can proceed with writing the letter even without the other elements of the process uh, having gotten underway. If that's Council's will, um, we'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Parrish is on the board. I hesitate to wade into the tension, but um, when the decision is made or granted by the province, this request that we're putting in now doesn't designate how we're going to do the extra vote. It doesn't say whether it's going to be a weighted vote or we're going to appoint somebody. Is that correct? Because we haven't had that discussion in Mississauga. Yeah, I, I think that the proposal that staff uh, believe council to have endorsed is to track as closely as possible the um, alternate member uh, yeah. provision that's available to Brampton and Caledon. And so in drafting the bylaw and bringing that forward, uh, we would use that approach. Um, that's not to say that council would be bound to accept that approach if it had a different idea, but that would be the sort of uh, starting point. Okay, so you're saying we will select one person? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sato. Thank you. Ju just further, um, Patrick, with regard to the timing, because that was an issue that I raised at the committee meeting as well, as Catherine recalls, that um, I would prefer that we do the letter to the ministry, as we have done in Mississauga, that, um, I mean, Council passed this on Thursday, December 19th, and I think we should be uh, we don't need to reaffirm this today, of course, because it's already been approved, but I think we should be giving direction today that the request go immediately to the minister requesting that the legislation be amended um, through whatever process so that that one part of the motion that we approved is dealt with now. And I, I guess I would hope that if the minister agrees to amend the legislation that we may not have to go through the process because I don't I don't recall now maybe we did but I thought when they brought in the, the legislation that put this in place for the um, for the previous for the beginning of this term that process did not need to be followed by the municipalities it was just put in place councillor council appointed it so <coughs> I would hope that through Mississauga sending our request to the minister and the region sending a request to the minister that we could put in that wording that we would like this to be done as quickly as possible. And if the minister comes back with a favorable response, then we don't need to go through the public meeting and everything else. We can just put it in place. Mississauga can appoint our member and we can get on with business. Patrick, did you want So, um, with respect, I think that to request of the province that they, that they create a different process. It's not a different process. They didn't do that process for the other municipalities when they brought the legislation in place. All we're asking them to do is add us in to legislation that they passed for the 2018 election, or for the 2018 to 22 term of office. So 
We're, we're not asking them to circumvent any process. We're saying, hey, look, you made a mistake. You omitted the city of Mississauga out of every other municipality in the province of Ontario, and I think the letter should be worded that way. And regional council has agreed that we need to fix that mistake, and we're asking you to go back and just add us in to that legislation so that we can go ahead and get our appointment done. I mean, to me, it's simple. You just say, hey, you made a mistake, you missed us, put us in. Fix your legislation. Pat let's, n let's not give them any legal reason, Patrick, to yeah. say no. Let's just assume that, oops, you made a mistake, you missed us, get it done. So that's what I'm suggesting that the letter that goes to, and it, it's, it's, I think our, our motion that we've already approved covers that. So the letter that goes should say that, you know, that this is your chance to fix something that inadvertently, because I'm sure they didn't sit down and say, oh, we're going to leave Mississauga out. You know, I think it was an oops. They didn't even think about it. <laughs> Hopefully. I'm going to assume they didn't. <laughs> I, I, so. I understand what you're asking for, and we can frame it. I think we would likely recommend that it be framed as an alternate request, that they either change that legislation. No, that I, left do, I don't want an alternate request. I want them to add us in. Let's just ask them to add us in. But they made a mistake. Don't give them any outs. No, I, I don't intend to, uh, but there are two separate, these are two separate provisions. And what you're asking for is an amendment to uh, the provision that gives Brampton and Caledon its, uh, yeah. and I understand that request, so we can make that request. There's a separate provision, and it's a complicated one, and we've described it at length, and it does require the triple majority, but it's there already. It's in your hands to initiate it. All it needs is a, a, a separate amendment to bring it into force this term of okay. council. So those are two separate requests. We can advance both of them. Okay, so I would suggest then that in your wording, because yes, when they brought in the legislation, they added this in, so if something wanted to change down the road, I guess. But I would say that we ask them that notwithstanding that provision for the public session and everything else that the minister be requested to make yeah. the amendment. So use the notwithstanding clause that, you know, explain it was obviously a mistake, you didn't realize what you were doing, you know, but <laughs> instead of putting us through all of this, make it a notwithstanding and just fix it. Can you do that? We can make that request. Okay, good. I would, I would move you. that as receipt and direction to staff to do it that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we still have uh, speakers on the board. Uh, Mayor Thompson. So I'm going to go back to the weighted vote. If you can't get a member, and especially with all the Mississaugas there, so you, you have the weighted mo vote, which would probably go with the mayor. But let's say the mayor's away. What you need to identify is whoever the acting mayor is uh, has that weighted vote so that you always have that ability to be represented. I, I know, but I mean, it's done at county councils all the time, you know? It, it, it's been a process for 150 years, so what I'm just saying is it, it's something that's been done municipally for years. It helps Mrs. It's an easy, one, easy fix for Mississauga. I'm just saying, why haven't we looked? I, when you read the report, we didn't really go in depth, but what I'm just saying, it makes sense. It's simple. It's easy to fix. Move on. Like, I mean... Most of the time, we're all we're a hundred percent complement. But if we don't, it at least gives you the flexibility to do it. That's all I'm just saying. And that way, you're not tying it to one person. Whoever the acting mayor is has that ability. If the mayor is not there to champion it, and that's generally like Orangeville, you know, they have a weighted vote. Uh, I can use that as an example. And I think they got four votes, but it's on certain things, right? It's not on everything. But I'm just saying it's it, it's something that's used all the time. So I'm just wondering, is that something we cannot? Con can we not consider that? I was kind of hoping there would be a little more depth on that, and there's just nothing there in the report. And if I missed it, please clarify. <laughs> Patrick? Oh, it's, um, it is there, actually, um, Mayor Thompson. Um, page 17.3-4 goes into the weighted voting uh, in, in some depth. Um, it, it does, but it... 
the you know an alternate member but what i'm just saying is why wouldn't that be that alternate member it's either mayor or acting mayor to me it makes it easy but it didn't identify that that's where i'm coming Thank from yes but that's that's how county councils do it so that's what i'm just saying no no but i mean it's the one okay. way of doing it for you that has at least you got to inform people sitting around making the decision okay Okay, thank you. Thank you for the comments. We still have speakers, so Mayor Crombie. Well, I want to thank uh, Mayor Thompson for his support on this issue, and he's trying to be proactive in giving us some solutions, so I appreciate it. My understanding was that we would, on a weighted vote, we would all get another one plus a little fraction, one twelfth or whatever, of a vote. Um, <clears throat> but I was kind of preferring the designated alternate voter um, and it would be kind of like a proxy vote so if I knew Councillor DeMurla would be voting on issues that I supported in the same way I'd want to give her my if I were going to be away at a conference or away ill <clears throat> like I should have been today um, I would give her my vote my proxy to vote for me as a my designate could it work that way rather I than that one little fraction we'd all get a little fraction of a vote <clears throat> Yes, the, the little fraction of a vote is, is complicated and problematic, we would suggest, and, and the report outlines that's what, why. That's what the report said. Uh, <coughs> if, we, if we are accepting as a principle that we should track as closely as possible what Caledon and Brampton already have, that would involve the designation of a, a single Mississauga Councillor. But what if uh, they're away too? It happens. That's a problem with the Caledon and, and Brampton model as well. Well, they have other people that can fill the bench. Uh, no, they have a designated uh, individual who can substitute. We've had two. We've had a, a replacement for Mayor Thompson and a replacement for somebody else. <laughs> Are you the only one? So, yep, I've, I'm seen told two, I've seen different people here. Oh, okay. Go ahead, yeah. If I may, through the chair, each of the local councils, so Brampton and Caledon, uh, have to pass a bylaw appointing a single councillor. Okay. So mm -hmm. what what Caledon did, you, you did see Councillor DeBoer was at one yes. meeting, and later Councillor Early was at a different meeting. Yes. Um, they, in Caledon, passed another bylaw replacing Councillor DeBoer with Councillor Early. So there is not two councillors available as an alternate. There is only one at any given time. It's Councillor Singh in Brampton, and it's been Councillor Singh for the whole term. Okay. What if you have two away? You just Brampton? get the one alternate to come in. Despite there being two Calvin councillors absent, I only see. one can come so to the table. So it's not like someone could carry your proxy as Correct. your vote. Correct. I see. Well, that would have been simpler because you'd pick the person who you know would vote. It would align your vote, right? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, also, I've been listening to the conversation, and obviously we want to find a way for Mississauga to be able to uh, compensate when someone is unable to attend. But if we're going to go to the extent where we're sending a letter to the minister, um, I'm not sure if we are actually going to do that now. I'm wondering. Yeah. So we've already approved to do that. So my question, I suppose, ties in the next communications item, which is 18.1. Um, we're currently uh, thinking about um, either uh, reaffirming our council composition or perhaps changing it. In the city of Brampton, it's one of the priorities that the city of Brampton has been looking at and asking for um, the, our population numbers to be recognized within the composition of this council. Um, and I, I've heard the mayor of Mississauga express support for a process, and I know we're undergoing that process now. Can uh, staff just uh, give a brief update on where we were at in terms of the review of the composition here at the region? But I understand, but if we're going to be sending a letter to ask... <coughs> okay, so that I'll is, hold off yeah, until the next yeah, item. Council, I, think, I think that is a complete... I think that is a separate... That's a separate process. Very good. So I'll wait for the next item. Okay. Thank you. And it is. it has been held. So can speak to that once we get through. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parrish. 
Yes, I'm going to agree with, with uh, Patrick O'Connor. The closer we can mimic what's already in the legislation and the closer we can mimic what's being done by Brampton and Caledon, the more likely they are to do it. It's very simple. For this term. Correct. Yes. And, and um, I thank Councillor or Mayor Thompson for his um, other suggestion, but I think to be safe, we do exactly what you guys do. We don't do it any differently. And I, I don't think selecting the mayor as the alternate is a good idea because we have a very busy mayor too and uh, often not here. So not often, but once in a while yeah, and on other business. So let's just make it as close as we can to what's in the legislation so they don't have to rack their brains for three years down there. Okay, thank you very much. A good discussion, lots of clarification. So we have a removal of receipt with uh, direction to staff to send a letter from the region. Okay, uh, we don't need a recorded vote, so I guess just a mover by, move by um, uh, Councillor Sato. All in favor, show of hands. Any opposed? Okay, that carries, thank you. Uh, now on to items of communication that were held. 18.1 is the letter from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Minister Clark. Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you. Um, the last time we went through this, uh, I think it was the mayors and the chair that uh, reviewed this. Uh, we do have the procedures and policy committee now. Um, the three mayors sit on that ex officio, as does the chair who attends regularly. So I would move that this discussion of uh, allocation of seats be sent to the procedures and policies committee. Okay, thank you, and that, that's the recommendation as well, correct? Uh, Ka uh, Catherine. Um, through the chair, that was actually already done at the last meeting. Uh, the report that was on the agenda at the last meeting um, was referred to that committee, and it will be on the agenda for that committee meeting on February 6th. That's, that's correct. This was just an additional letter, and uh, the recommendation is that we'll refer this letter to the to same the committee for the discussion at the same time. Okay. So we'll put okay. it on the same agenda. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Mayor Thompson. Well, I agree with where uh, Councillor Parrish is going, but I also want to clear uh, with Ms. Locke here as well that we're going to be looking at efficiencies because I know that was something the province has asked us to that uh, no duplication at either layer, so we've got to find out who does what. Are we going to review that with that same committee as well? Because that was a request that the minister did ask when he made the announcement at the end of October, beginning of November. We could make that a, a motion with a, a seconder and refer it to the, to the committee. I'm willing to make that a motion as well because that's <laughs> kind of expected. They kind of need that done by the end of June. Uh, so we, I think we need to look at that because if not, the minister, you know, the province may decide to do that for us. So I, I'd rather be in control of this. So we can take that as a notice of motion for the next um, council meeting. Do so we have time to make that, to make the February meeting? We could do a two-thirds vote to waive the requirement of notice to add it um, to the February 6th agenda. If you take, do a two-thirds notice here. Waive I would recommend here. we do that just, just for time of the essence to get things moving. Okay, so... Okay, so just looking to clerks from a process standpoint. So we have... You'd need the two-thirds vote first to see if you wanted to add a motion at this time to be heard at this time. And then if, if council agrees that the motion can be heard today, then you could do the debate on the motion. And then that motion would just have a, a simple majority to pass. Okay, so looking to the board, okay. Mayor Cromie, take your name. Okay, so we need Councillor Vicente. Were you to? You're to speaking to the motion for waiving the rules or to the main yeah, motion? Yeah, I'm. We okay. So we have a motion to open to look at two thirds. Right. We need a seconder for that. Right. That's and that was okay. what my ask was. So should he from a a pro procedural standpoint, be able to speak first before. Exactly. Okay. Understood. Sorry. Okay. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, in hearing that um, this item and this issue is being referred to the Procedures and Policy Committee, 
that certainly satisfies me that the, we're going to be having that conversation at committee level and then it comes to council. But also for the benefit of uh, members who may not be aware of all of the history, would it be possible for staff to forward uh, to all members uh, some of the background reports that, or the reports that have been received by council before, including the Justice Adams reports? and uh, other reports that staff may have presented to council on this issue of the regional composition. So that's direction. Yes. OK, okay. thank you. We'll take that thank direction. You. Thank you. OK, anything further, Councillor Vicente? No, thank you very much. OK, so are we moving uh, if I could, uh, Madam Chair, if we, what I would recommend is I would ask for a two-thirds vote to, to waive the motion to allow us to recommend that we do this. At, if we're getting everybody together, let's deal with the both issues at the same time because it's been requested by the province to do this. Okay, so, so, the, so, so, what so just a second, just a second. So looking to clerks, item 18.1, we have now... We've had the referral to the procedures committee right. with direction from Councillor Vicente, Vicente right. to include background. Do we move this first and then go to Mayor Thompson? Or yes. do we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, is this a recorded vote? No. It's it not. is not. Show of hands, moved by Councillor Parrish. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Now, Mayor Thompson, you're on the board. Thank you. So what I would like to do is also uh, the request that the province asks us to do is to find the efficiencies to reduce duplication. It's an exercise we need to go through. And it go, it, it's tied with the governance and so that's why I'm saying let's look at both things. When we have the committees and procedures put together, let's do it at the same time. We're all busy. We're going to have that meeting. Let's, let's work through it to understand what we do. Because if we don't have something done by the end of June on this, the province will probably dictate to us, region, this is going to do this, and the lower tiers are going to do that. So let's try to be proactive and take the lead and find if we can find ways to find efficiencies at uh, what level government's the most way to deliver the services for our residents? As we committed to. As we committed to. So what I'm asking is, is, now that I know this, we need a two-thirds vote. If I'm asking if we could get a two-thirds vote so we can bring this forward and deal with this at the February 6th meeting. Okay, we have, we have Ava on the board. Yes, we can. <laughs> so you need a seconder. A seconder? Councillor Vicente. Okay, we have a seconder to get the motion to reopen for two thirds. We have right. Councillor Vicente. So we need to do a record. Are, are, Councillor Parrish, are you speaking yeah, I, to I, this? I, as the chair of that committee, I'm getting a little panicky. We have a meeting on January 30th to finalize the code of conduct, which is going to be like three, four hours work. Then we have a meeting on the 6th, which has already got a packed agenda, and the two mayors won't be there. And I, I would beg you to let us schedule another meeting in about four weeks to handle what you're talking about and make it exclusively for that subject. Otherwise, staff's never going to be able to give us enough material to even start. It's, 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 it will be it's fair enough, but I think that I'm surprised that it just hasn't been brought forward because we all knew as of... November that we needed to do this and it's now January. No, I get that. January's gone, right? I think we so. also have to ask the staff if they're going to be able to get stuff ready for sometime the end of February to start this. Fair enough. If you, as long as we can just get this on the priority mm -hmm. and we're just going to have to drive it hard once we get it there. Yeah, but don't force it on an agenda that's already packed. That's all I'm worried about. Okay, Fair enough. So, um, okay. so I, you know, we can waive that, but I'll just make a motion that, you know, as a notice motion that we go forward with it. Is that the easiest way then? Yeah, we'll talk okay. about it next week Fair and we'll be more, more prepared. Okay. Okay, so we had, Ava, you had your hand up. <laughs> okay, um, so Mayor Thompson, you're withdrawing your motion and you will submit a notice of motion. 
Yes, correct. Okay. We'll make sure that we get that on there. It's just, it's, it's just, we're running, okay. the clock's running out. So okay. we'll work with that. And, and uh, Mr. Chair, I think we just we'll want to make sure we get our wording right on that. So I'm okay with that then. I appreciate those comments. Now that I know we can't get it on the February 6th agenda, but we need to get that. And also to Councillor Parachute Chairs that it's a packed agenda. So, okay, that's great. Councillor Ross is on the board. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I guess my question is, why are we sending it to Policy and Procedures Committee? Is that the most appropriate place to do so? And, and could it not just come to full council here so we can deal with it at once? Um, I think we all have um, an obligation to be involved in that type of decision. And, and given the time constraints, we could probably deal with it more expeditiously at a full council meeting. Yeah. So... Mayor Thompson, that would be in terms of your motion, your uh, notice of motion, when you put that forward, you would want it to come to full council to be on an agenda? Well, it'll or have to come to council on the full agenda next 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 round, right? So, which, is it next week or two weeks? February 13th. Yeah. February 13th. February 13th. So it'll come on that to have it ready for that, but I okay. think the staff know about that. But I think of once it explains on who does what, and I think the minister made it abundantly clear, we got to find these efficiencies. The reason why he kicked, punted it back and didn't make a decision on the governance and everything else, he said he heard 67% of the municipalities and the public asked that we solve our problems first. Well, the problem is we got till June to decide on this because they're going to make their decisions in the fall economic statements. So we, if we don't, they're going to do it for us over the summer. So I think it's very important that Peel takes the lead and get this right. So I'm willing to uh, share work with the mayors to develop a motion to make sure that everybody's good with this, along with the regional chair, so that we can all educate and go forward. It's an education on all of us, but this is what's asked of us. We need to deliver on this. And I, one governance is one thing, but this is the other part. And we need to have the, both of them done. That's, that's the concern. And this is a big, this is a big issue. It's, you know, it's gonna be complex. Councilor Raz, I agree with okay. you. It's very complex, but I, we gotta start somewhere. And I think maybe it needs to start there and come back to council. I'm just trying to find efficiencies floor, to yes. it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Councilor Ross, uh, yes you do. And perhaps my suggestion uh, is, I don't think policy and procedures is the right committee. Maybe we can strike an ad hoc committee related to budget and efficiencies with a select group from all three municipalities. And I'm happy to be a part of that. Um, I'm doing that. I'm not so sure. Maybe we should have maybe the CEOs at the table too. I don't know, you know, because it is it's structure. I don't know. Yes. Think it through. Let's think it through. Thr um, think why don't through we have dialogue motion. and we'll just kick it around and uh, see if we can get something for the next meeting. Yes. Does that sound fair, Mr. Chair? Okay. Okay, Mayor Crombie. Thank you. So I'm not in disagreement. I think we need to find efficiencies. That's certainly what the province is after. We propose one solution, but it's been turned down. Um, but I don't know that any of us know how to go about finding savings through efficiencies. And so I was gonna propose that we do on a programs and services audit and hire a firm to do that for us. And I think there's money available at the province to help us. There is. Right, so I'd like to move that then. If I, Mayor Crumb, yes. I think that's the perfect thing for the committee to discuss and what that entails, et cetera. But I, I sort of had a similar thought, but I think we need to have a discussion. There is monies available to us. They keep reminding us of that. Yes. And, but I think we have a need, need an intermediate step to get there, but I think the suggestion is a good one. Yes. So back to where we are, let's have the mayor sit down and say, why don't we, t and, and I, it's not just what you do, it's what you're seen to be doing, and you're absolutely correct. The minister's made it very clear. The ball's in your court. I've said before, what happened wasn't uh, a, a resolution. It was, here's the carrot before I come back with the stick. So you're absolutely right, because we. I, I want to hear ideas, I'm on here solutions. Uh, so uh, good on all of us. Let's get a template that we can all agree to. But Mayor Crombie, I think your idea should be part of, could very well be part of that template. But okay. let's understand all the moving okay. parts and part of your motion to be clear that we uh, are succinct on that front. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, great. Very good discussion. And so we will await the, uh, the uh, motion from Mayor Thompson for another agenda. Okay, on to item 18.2, Association of Municipalities of Ontario Communication. Mayor Thompson. Okay. You held this. Yes. So, and yes, I, I have a really good understanding where this is going. So, 
Uh, we don't have, theoretically, we have a police services board, but we don't because there's no representation at the board. This is not for council to decide. I would like to punt this to the police services board to find out if they want to deal with the OPP component. If they don't, then Town of Caledon knows what we need to do. But there's no point in having duplication when we already have the infrastructure in place. But to do that, it means then Caledon needs elected representation at the board. It's very complicated, but I really think this isn't the place to have the discussion. I really think it needs to go to the police services board and have the executive director there decide how that best looks. So, Mayor Thompson, you're moving receipt of the correspondence with direction to having... Having this uh, forwarded to the police services board. board. Peel police services board. Okay. Uh, this does not need a recorded vote. Uh, moved by Mayor Thompson. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, carried. Thank you, and I believe that is back to you. Yes, thank Chair. you. That brings us to item 18. Other business or council inquiries? Councillor Dasko. Thank you, through the Chair. I just wanted to uh, give a, a special shout out to uh, Brad Bowie, um, I guess media relations for the region of Peel Paramedics for while he was on vacation, uh, was, uh, was a, a hero uh, down south of the border. And uh, it was uh, mentioned by Chief Dundas. I just wanted to uh, bring mention to that. Uh, doesn't just do it on the clock, but uh, lives and breathes it. So uh, special thanks. Well said and good on all of us because of him. We made the region of Peel proud. Councillor Parrish. Yeah, I just, uh, to do with the procedures and policy committee, um, for our meeting in February, one of the things we're going to be looking at is the criteria for a new CAO and a search and all the rest of it. I would like to send a little questionnaire out to everybody around the table so that we have some material back to work with to get started so that we know what everybody sets as priorities and what everybody would like to see. So if you get it from me, um, I'll, I'll probably do it through uh, the clerk's office and it'll be kept confidential. Councillor Pileschi? Um, uh, I'm what? I, I don't think you can do that. I think that's advancing the business of the corporation. I think I would support any type of questionnaire, but I think that has to come from from staff. I don't I believe... From the oh, I, I just heard you say you were going to send that out. Well, I am... In instigating it, the clerk will do it, and it will go to the clerk, the clerk will summarize it, and she won't tell us what you said. <laughs> okay, so just to make sure that we're all above board, you're putting something together with HR, I assume, to send out to members of council with respect to the hiring of the CAO for the, for the region. No, but it's to set your priorities, where you see the region going, what you'd like, what sort of direction you'd like to see us go in, what sort of person you would like us to look for. Should maybe we expand on this and, and potentially move this to a public consultation? No. no. Uh, if, if I, I could... just saying it, how good you were. Yeah, if I could, you. just to help uh, our Chair. HR people out, Mary, how do you understand that unfolding? How do these things unfold in, in the normal sense? Just, a lot of moving parts. I want to make sure we're just clear on all the parts and what, Councillor Parrish, what you hope to achieve and hopefully Mary telling me, yep, that can be or isn't part of a format. Just in the normal course, how would you expect to proceed? What would you tell Councillor the logical next steps? Um, so, the so as part of our recruitment process, we obviously would reach out to find out um, what Council is looking for. Um, so that is something that we will undertake to do. Um, I can work with uh, uh, staff from the clerk's office on how we can do that and then gather that feedback. And Carolyn, it's been done many times before. Any time we've hired, they just call, but just the right conduit to do it, and I think we've got it. So thank you, uh, Carolyn and Michael. So that's been addressed. Any other? I have no others on my list. That brings me to notices of motion. We've dealt with the only one that we had. The bylaws, Madam Clerk, if you can provide them. Moved by Councillor Kovac, seconded by Councillor Tony that, uh, Downey, that the bylaws listed on January 23, 2020, Regional Council agenda, being bylaw 6 2020, be given the required number of readings, taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. You've heard the motion. All those in favor? 
Any opposed, that is carried. That brings me to in camera, and I'm at 12.30. What is the wish of my colleagues? Would you like to try? I would suggest we try, Councillor DeMera. If everybody is comfortable for that, why don't we carry on with the in camera? So I'm going to read the in camera motion at this time, moved by Councillor Sinclair and Starr. That from the in camera, I have a motion moved by Councillor Carlson, seconded by Councillor Starr, that the recommendations contained within the confidential report relating to item 22.1 listed on the January 23, 2020 Regional Council agenda be approved and become public upon adoption, and further that the oral in-camera updates listed as items 22.2 .2 and 22.4 on the January 24, 2020 Regional Council agenda be received, and further that the in-camera update listed as item 22.3 on the January 22, 2020 Regional Council agenda be received. You have heard the motion, I need a recorded vote from what has come to us from the in-camera. All those in favour of those directions. That carries. Moving on, motion from Councillor Dasco, seconded by Councillor Pale uh, Pileschi, that bylaw 7 2020 to confirm the proceedings of regional council at its meeting held January 23, 2020, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the region appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required number of readings, taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the deputy regional clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. All those in favor, show of hands, that carries. And finally, moved by Councillor Fonseca, seconded by Mayor Crombie, that the January 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting be adjourned. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you all very much. Okay.